Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tony J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tony J. Laird. All right, so today I want to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, traditionally on this channel, I publish long-form civil and structural engineering course lectures. Uh, this video is going to be a bit more of a video essay format, so trying something a bit different. Uh, today, we'll be talking not about a specific course, but something more specific and a bit more general. Uh, today, we'll be talking about table saws, terrifying energies, machines working faster than thought, a German industrial table saw, and machine learning technology. So, uh, for a bit of background, uh, I'm a no by no means an expert in machine learning. Uh, I am a PhD student in civil engineering and wood science. I hold a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and master's degrees in uh, civil engineering and education. Uh, I've taught civil and structural engineering coursework for many years, and I'm currently working on my PhD, as I mentioned. Uh, machine learning is not my field, and it likely isn't uh, for most of the people watching this. Uh, so I, instead of going into the nitty gritty of how of these uh, machine learning algorithms are programmed, I'm going to be discussing things from a broader perspective. Uh, I'm going to be discussing machine learning systems in the general sense, how they are created, and some of their limitations. I'm not going to give you a deep uh, technical dive into these systems, uh, how to create them, code them, etc. That is a bit beyond my expertise, and there are certainly better people out there for that. Rather, I hope to instill an appreciation for how these systems work uh, and when we need to be skeptical of their uses and claims. They are a very useful technology, but they are by no means oracles. They're not magic, they're not gods, and we, need to, we do need to be aware of uh, how they're created and also their limitations. Uh, I believe that in a modern society, a general technical understanding of the systems and tools we interact with is really an essential life skill. Uh, for example, let me give you a structural engineering example. I don't expect most people to have the skills to work through the calculations uh, in designing something even as relatively simple as, say, a single-family home. But I do think every homeowner should have, you know, some understanding that homes, like any structure, are designed with certain uses and limits in mind. Uh, if you decide, for example, um, if you decide to use your home as a lead warehouse and stack every room in your home, you know, floor to ceiling with lead bricks, in all likelihood, it's going to collapse. You know, you do not have to be an expert in structural engineering or analysis to know that it's really an incredibly bad idea uh, to load your house as a lead warehouse. If you assume your home just has infinite capacity and can carry a limitless amount of load, uh, you may very well find yourself without a roof over your head. <laughs> now, structures uh, do tend to be designed uh, fairly conservatively. So even if you fill your living space, you know, with a bunch of very heavy solid wooden furniture, you're unlikely to have a problem. Um, structural engineers design structures to envelope uh, many possible use cases, but there are limits. And really, no sane structural engineer is designing a single-family home with enough, with enough just incredibly excess capacity that it could safely be, you know, stacked floor to ceiling with lead bricks. Again, I do not expect everyone to be able to you, you know, to be able to perform structural analysis and do structural design calculations. However, it is reasonable to expect that every homeowner, that every uh, homeowner, should have enough common sense to realize that structures have finite capacities and doing really weird things with them. Uh, can cause problems, in some cases quite serious problems. The same applies to many topics and issues in the modern world. People do not need to be nuclear physicists to appreciate the capability of nuclear weapons and what effect they have had on how nations interact. You don't need to be a climate scientist to understand the basic mechanisms of the greenhouse gas effect, greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, uh, and issues like wet bulb temperatures and, reason and regional resilience. Uh, economic issues such as the meaning and, and implications of interest rates, inflation, and intergenerational demographics have a powerful effect on our individual lives. There are scientific and technical subjects that are simply foundational knowledge to 21st century life, and machine learning is becoming one of those. We've seen remarkable progress in this field in just the last few years, and progress really continues at a frenetic pace. Uh, we've seen some very interesting things, some very cool technologies, and it's going to have a lot of very uh, good and uh, great applications. But like anything, it does have its limits. So. Like any new technology, there is a great deal of hype around it, and grifts do abound. Uh, there's a lot of people running around promising miracles and sort of relying on, uh, maybe you could say, common ignorance. There's a lot of uh, people running around saying, uh, trying to convince you of the impossible, or trying to convince you that uh, certain algorithms are more oracles than they are the actual computer programs built by human beings that they are. 
And even when a grift isn't in play, uh, machine learning can often be used in ways that are inappropriate and irresponsible. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So in the last year or so, I've been thinking quite a bit about machine learning, AI systems, etc. Uh, like most of you, I imagine, I've toyed a bit with ChatGPT and image creation tools like Midjourney, and it's been uh, a topic I've been reading up on, trying to gain at least a general sense of how the technology works and its limitations. Uh, there's a few rec uh, videos I can recommend, and they're in the links below. Uh, I've been looking for an opportunity to talk about it, and a video showed up in my feed recently uh, that gave me just this kind of opportunity. So uh, my research is in the field of wood science and civil engineering. I've re I'm specifically, I'm researching the uh, topic of the moisture durability of certain veneer-based mass timber composite products. I'm also a woodworker myself and have a, a, a workshop that I like to build furniture and various household items in. So through both my uh, research and personal interests and hobbies, I work a lot with wood as a material and uh, related uh, tools such as table saws, planers, uh, miter saws, uh, etc. And uh, through that, I watch a fair amount of woodworking content. So I suppose it's no surprise that a video about a table saw sh uh, showed up in my feed. And the video I want to talk about is by a channel called 731 Woodworks. Uh, there is a link to it below. And this video appears to be recorded at some sort of in industry trade show. And the video features an explanation and demonstration of a table saw with a safety system that I had uh, never seen one quite like it before. The table saw in question is this really fancy, really cool uh, sliding table saw from a German manufacturer called Altendorf. Now, uh, this saw is not something you would buy for a hobby wood shop, uh, unless you're the sort of person uh, to spend as much on your woodworking equipment as you would on a nice new car. Although, as an aside, the table saw I have is probably worth as much as my car, although we're a bit weird, so we just have one vehicle, a uh, mid-2000s Corolla. It works for us, my partner works from home, I use my e-bike to get to campus, it works for us. But anyway, this the table saw featured here is this massive industrial uh, sliding table saw. A random hobbyist could, in theory, buy it, but it costs starting at $50,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, so it's clearly intended for uh, production cabinet shops, custom millwork operations, high-end custom cabinetry, and other assorted uh, uh, production wood uh, furniture and carpentry producers. So I recommend you check, check the video out. It actually is really interesting. And the saw itself, safety uh, system aside, is from, woodworking's, from a woodworker's perspective, really just absolutely drool worthy. If money and space were no, were no object, I would love to have something like that in my shop. Uh, but for a hobbyist woodworker, this would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, someone spending like half a million dollars on a car. Uh, not something except, not something except really the, like the obscenely wealthy could, would purchase for personal use. Uh, the saw has an amazingly well-made and balanced sliding input table that I thought was really cool. And it has a lot of really interesting computerized controls and all sorts of bells and whistles. So from my perspective as a hobbyist, this might as well be like the table saw of the gods. So as far as their products, like I've never worked with one of their, one of their machines personally, but it does seem to be a very high quality product. Um, it, what I really want to talk about, though, is not the saw itself or its, uh, you know, sliding mechanism or anything like that. Rather, I want to talk about its uh, safety mechanism. So what really got my attention about this saw was its uh, safety system. Now, you don't have to be a medical doctor or a PhD student w in wood science to know that a table saw is really kind of an innately dangerous thing. Uh, it is easily one of, if not the most versatile and useful tools in most workshops. Uh, but it ultimately is a rapidly, a large rapidly spinning blade that you feed wood through. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that this can cause severe injury from kickback, getting your, uh, from kickback to getting your hand caught in the blade, etc. Uh, table saws can be used safely, but you have to educate yourself in the potential ways they can go wrong. Uh, you can go right now and search uh, table saw kickback and find all sorts of videos on YouTube uh, and other places documenting the risks and ways to prevent kickback. And a table saw is meant to cut large volumes of lumber quickly. If a saw can cut through, if it has the power to cut through three inches of solid oak without breaking a sweat, it will go through your fingers, hand, or your entire arm uh, before your brain can even process what is happening. A, se a severe injury on a table saw can occur literally faster than thought itself. A table saw is not a hot stove. It's, you know, like a hot stove, you can touch the surface of the hot stove and your brain can react fast enough 
to start feeling the temperature, start feeling the heat, start feeling the pain, and withdraw your hand back before you un you get any kind of serious uh, injury. But that does not work with large, uh, very uh, rapidly spinning blades like you have on a table saw. You can't touch the blade, feel pain, and pull uh, pull the hand and pull your hand back before serious damage is done. It's just not possible. Before your brain can even start to process what is happening, your fingers will be gone. So make no mistake, uh, table saws really are a potential safety risk. Uh, much care needs to be taken to use proper blade guards. You need to understand how kickback works and how, pe and how pieces can, bl can bind on the blade and between the blade and the fence. Uh, you need to know how to align your table saw's fence to prevent binding. You need to know how and what directions to apply pressure to wood as you feed it through a saw in order to prevent it from becoming a safety hazard. Uh, you need to know how to use blade guards, splitters, riving knives, and how to safely perform cuts in case you can't use uh, in, in, ca in cases and cuts where you can't use your uh, saws blade guards. And there are some cases, some particular difficult cuts, where you simply can't uh, perform the cut while leaving the blade guard on. And above all else, regardless of how, you ex how experienced you are with a saw, you need to respect it. There are plenty of woodworkers and professional carpenters who've been, uh, you know, d working with a table saw for 30 years and have never had a serious injury, and then they lose several fingers on their first day of their 30th year of woodworking. So above all, you need to respect these tools. It is a tool that can seriously hurt you, and you have to, have to be, you have to be able to respect that power. I certainly respect mine. I currently have all my fingers, and I intend to keep it that way. Now, uh, the safety techniques I mentioned are true of all saws, even those made a century or more ago. So things like uh, you know aligning the fence, things like blade guards, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, applying pressure to pieces of wood as you're pushing through, pushing them through the blade. All of these things are universal to almost all table saws. Uh, you know, you could use the you could use them as on a saw made today or a saw made a hundred years ago. But considering the risks involved, it's no surprise that a lot of brilliant people over the years have put their minds to work trying to improve uh, the safety of table saws. It, often they've tried to harness the power of modern computers and electronics uh, technology to make a new uh, to make a saw safer. But really, it is a hard problem. Again, these are injuries that occur quite literally faster than the blink of an eye. My saw, for example, will spin a 10 inch diameter blade at approximately 4,000 RPM. And if you do some quick math, uh, you'll find that that 4,000 RPM is 419 radians per second. And at 419 radians per second, a 4,000 RPM 10 inch diameter blade has its teeth traveling at 175 feet per second, 53 meters per second, 192 kilometers per hour, or 119 miles per hour. So uh, for if you want to get a sense of the kind of uh, reaction times and energies and forces involved, imagine a typical passenger car. Imagine just like a car you might own or see going down the highway, whatever. Uh, not something like a, you know, a fancy sports car or like a racing car or anything like that. Just a regular, you know, regular passenger car or SUV or whatnot. They typically have governors that kick in somewhere in the range of 110 to 130 miles an hour, something like that. So imagine a typical passenger car traveling right up against its max possible speed in flagrant violation of the speed limit. Uh, it's going as fast as it can right up against the limits of its engine or governor. And just for fun, imagine the uh, that car is covered entirely in razor blades. That is the power of a table saw blade. <laughs> So imagine trying to engineer a safety system to cope with these fantastical forces. Uh, go back to the automobile comparison. Imagine you're a car designer. Imagine trying to design an automated system to prevent uh, pedestrian collisions. And imagine you wanted to design a system that would totally present, prevent a vehicle from uh, colliding with a pedestrian. As in, imagine you want to design a car that was so safe that even if, if a pedestrian uh, right next to the car, deliberately threw themselves into the path of the vehicle, uh, it would still be able to prevent that. Somehow the car would be able to swerve out of the way, uh, rapidly brake, deploy some sort of weird airbag system or something. Uh, you wanted to design a car that is so safe that even if a pedestrian literally throws themselves in front of the vehicle as it's traveling at 120 miles an hour, it, the, the, the vehicle will still not strike the, the, uh, the pedestrian. Um, so 
that is kind of the scale of reaction time that we're dealing with here when you're talking about preventing injuries from a t from a table saw blade. It's not a perfect analogy, but certainly not by any means. Like the momentum of a car going on the freeway is definitely a lot, lot definitely a lot more than the momentum of a table saw blade. But in terms of reaction times, it's not so different. So this is not so much the domain of the uh, ancient carpenter as it is the domain of, say, a, ro a NASA rocket scientist designing a machine that can automatically land itself on Mars. Despite the immense technical challenge, uh, individuals and companies have attempted to do this seemingly impossible task and create a table saw with active safety measures. Now, uh, what, I mean, what I mean by an active safety measure is something that relies on electronics, motors, spring-loaded mechanisms, whatever it may be, to actively prevent or ameliorate a table saw injury. A passive safety measure would be something like a blade guard or a splitter or a riving knife. These are things that are just pieces of material that are placed in the location to, as to help prevent an injury. An active measure is something that is actively monitored. It's an electrical or mechanical device that's meant to uh, reduce the chance or consequences of an injury. So uh, there, have been, there have been several companies that have attempted this. Uh, the most famous example would probably be a company called SawStop. Uh, they have a technology that harnesses electrical properties. Uh, when you touch a spinning uh, table, uh, spinning metal table saw blade, your body comes into electrical contact with that blade. Uh, this changes the conductivity and capacitance of the table saw blade and its uh, associated, you know, connected metal enclosure. Um, and this is something that if you have the right equipment, you can measure. So if you have a uh, you know a system wired up to the table saw blade, uh, wired up to the arbor and uh, the associated components, that contact will produce a change in the conductivity and capacitance of that whole system, and that can be measured. And if you're and and, and because it is an elect and one of the nice things about electrical properties is that they can be measured very quickly. So. Now, a table saw blade will take off your fingers faster than thought, but compared to humans, uh, computers think quite fast. Compared to computers, humans don't actually think that fast at all. Modern electronics are fast and sensitive enough that they can uh, detect that change in capacitance before your finger, uh, or at least they likely can detect the, the change in capacitance, uh, before your finger even uh, loses contact with the first tooth that it touches. Electrical uh, signals can, can be passed and uh, processed uh, with comparable rapid speed. Uh, computer, in other words, computers and signaling aren't the limitation. Rather, the real limitation in such, a, such an active sy system is just the physical time it takes to stop the spinning saw blade itself. Again, you're talking about something that is spinning at 4,000 revolutions per minute. You're talking about a blade that has a tip speed of 120 miles an hour. That system has just a tiny, 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 any fraction of a second uh, in order to uh, drop the, sa the saw blade down or stop it or do something to prevent it from just completely taking your finger off. Now, the saw stop system uh, solved this in a really interesting way. Uh, they have a brake positioned a small fraction of an inch from the spinning blade itself, thus absolutely minimizing the distance the brake needs to travel. Uh, this brake is connected to a very stiff uh, spring compressed under, under an enormous amount of force. It's held in place right next to the spinning blade uh, with a compressed spring just waiting to jam itself right into the spinning blade. Uh, when the computer system triggers it, a brake comes up and jams itself into the saw blade, and a further mechanism turns the rotational momentum of the blade so the blade is spinning around rap rapid, 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 uh, spinning around rapidly, and the, the braking mechanism is designed in such a way that it channels most of that momentum, most of that rotational momentum into downward momentum, forcing the blade below the top of the, uh, the table saw surface. So, um, and it really is just hard, it really is hard to convey in words just how rapid this process is. Mm -hmm. uh, the, whole system, the whole thing uh, takes less than five milliseconds. Yes, five milliseconds. I can tell you that number, but do you have any idea how short a time that is? I like that is such that is such a small number that it just it loses any sense of human meaning. Uh, you literally cannot perceive events that short. We use the phrase a blink of an eye to describe short events, but a single blink at its fastest, I looked it up, is about a hundred milliseconds. So that's between a hundred uh, between. Um, so this is between. Uh, so this table saw. Uh, 
I looked at the low end and high end, and this table saw, the saw set table saw safety mechanism uh, activates between 1 25th and 1 100th the, of a blink of an eye, depending on how long the particular eye blink in question is. That is fast enough that even if you touch the saw blade with your fingertip, you would have anything worse than a very thin surface cut or a nick on your skin. Uh, you might end up with, if things go, you know, in the worst case scenario, you might have, end up with a, you know, a small, scar, uh, a small scar on the surface of your finger to remind you, but you will keep all your fingers. You won't lose a hand. You won't lose an arm. You won't, you won't have any permanent injury. It is so fast that it literally is about a 1 25th or 1 100th the blink of an eye. And in that tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimal fraction of a, of, of a second, the whole, uh, the whole saw blade mechanism just instantly drops below the surface of the table saw. Now, uh, for the sake of full disclosure, I actually do own a saw stop cabinet saw. Uh, I do do a lot of woodworking, as I said. Uh, and even outside of the, the safety mechanisms, there are just very well-made saws. That's pr the primary reason I bought one. And they're also a company based right here where I am in Oregon. Uh, so that's kind of a nice little uh, plus. And while I do own a saw stop and I'm a fan of them, uh, I'm in no way sponsored by them or, or by them or any other manufacturer. I have a saw stop, but I purchased it at full price with money from my own pocket. I have no relationship with them uh, beyond that of a regular retail customer. And as far as a hobbyist cost goes, yeah, it is a pretty pricey tool. I think I paid a bit over uh, 3K for mine, but I bought it knowing that it, that if the safety mechanism prevented even a single visit to the ER, well, considering American medical medical costs, that saw would pay for itself after if it could prevent a single injury. I bought it knowing that it would be the probably the last uh, table saw I would ever need to buy. And again, if it prevents a single injury, even at the cost that it is, it would uh, pay for itself uh, potentially many times over. Now, there are, however, some limitations to a system like this. It is a conductivity and capacitance-based system, so it's an electrical properties-based system. And while contact with a finger or thumb can trigger it, other conductive objects can as well. It's tuned to the conductivity changes that occur when a, uh, you know, human flesh basically comes in contact with the table saw blade. Um, but any kind of material that has a uh, that will produce a change in conductivity or capacitance can do the same. So, for example, if there is a nail in a board you're trying to cut through and the blade hits the nail, it could trigger the mechanism. Uh, cutting very green wood, which is wood with a very uh, wet wood that's just uh, uh, freshly cut, still has a lot of moisture in it, that in rare cases might tr cause it to trigger uh, a sort of like a false positive as well. Um, also, this it, the one down one major downside of this system is that it is a very violent process, uh, not to the user of the saw, but to the saw blade itself. So while you don't take, while you probably won't take any damage from the saw blade itself, uh, as it uh, is uh, rapidly bro uh, breaked and uh, dropped below the surface of the table saw, uh, this this blade does have a ton of kinetic energy and momentum behind it. Again, this thing is spinning around at 4,000 RPM. So all that energy has to go somewhere. Um, Newton is a heartless SOV and will not be cheated. That energy has to go somewhere. And where it goes, it goes into causing the brake cartridge uh, to undergo plastic or permanent deformation. The, saw, the brake cartridge on a saw stop is a single use item. Again, it works by just uh, using a spring loaded mechanism to just jam itself right into the surface of the spinning saw blade or the edge of the spinning saw blade. So um, this is a fairly violent process that just completely wrecks the brake. It is a single use item. Um, also, saw blades themselves aren't exactly designed to, sa to have uh, slugs of metal jammed into them at 120 miles an hour. So they typically won't completely fly, up, fly apart in just like a cloud of, you know, shrapnel after, after the saw stop mechanism kicks in. But you don't want to use such a blade after it has been stopped like this. Not only will multiple teeth be destroyed, but the whole blade's structure will be, may be compromised. So really, after firing, the brake is physically jammed into the blade. And even if you want to remove the brake the, the, uh, break from the blade, you're going to need to like take that blade and put it in a bench vise and separate them with a hammer in order to dislodge them. Now, uh, how do I know this? How do I know you need to use a uh, hammer to actually dislodge a uh, saw blade after the saw stop cartridge has triggered? Well, because I have personal experience. Uh, I've done just that. Now, uh, notice the unique design of this brake. What, oh, backing up, what this is, is this is actually a triggered uh, saw stop uh, mechan uh, braking mechanism or braking cartridge. So again, this thing sits up onto the saw blade. There, initially it's like this, 
and if the uh, electrical contact is made, it sends this thing, it sends this brake cartridge uh, flying up. There was a spring here that sort of got lost along the way, and it jams up right into the surface of the saw blade. In fact, if you look closely, you can actually see pieces of the old uh, saw blade still jammed in. There's still a few teeth jammed into that brake cartridge, uh, even after I separated them. So, and also interesting, uh, interesting to note, look at how the, uh, the uh the shape of the metal here has been deformed uh this has undergone permanent plastic deformation and that's where the energy of the saw blade the spinning saw blade went uh the spinning saw blade all that energy has to go somewhere and it went into uh deforming this uh particular part of the brake cartridge and that's just how that's just all part of how the system is designed so it's designed with these little elements that buckle and dissipate and absorb energy. And yes, unfortunately, I did manage to trigger uh, mine once. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, it is an experience that you will not soon forget. It sounds like a gunshot going off. And, uh, you know, I lived in Texas. I have fired firearms before. So yes, I can report that it's, that it's not the same sound, but it is a similarly powerful sound. Uh, now, thankfully, in my case, I didn't have to risk a hand in the process. I actually managed to, tr to uh, trigger it when I didn't set up a miter gauge properly, and I caused an aluminum miter gauge that, uh, that I had uh, to brush up against the uh, side of the saw blade. Uh, the, me the mechanism didn't prevent me, so uh, because of that, the mechanism didn't prevent me from losing a finger, but it quite possibly did prevent me from having a uh, miter gauge uh, launched directly into my face at 100 miles an hour, which... Uh, I'm no medical expert, but I'm pretty sure it will ruin your day. Now, as I noted, the cartridge is a single-use item, and it wrecks any blade it touches to the point of being really completely useless. In other words, when this thing goes off, you need to replace both the cartridge and the saw blade. The costs of these vary, especially the uh, saw blade themselves. There's all sorts of different qualities of saw blades. You can spend, you know, you can spend 20 bucks on a saw blade and the costs just keep going up and up and up depending on how fancy your blade is. But uh, for a rough uh, idea, um, the costs again vary, but it wouldn't be wrong to think of uh, setting one of these things off as the equivalent of setting a $100 bill on fire. Every time one of these goes off, it's going to cost you somewhere in the range of 100 US dollars and up depending on the price of your blade. Now, this is still way, way better than losing a finger. And of course, it's way cheaper than uh, the resulting medical bills, assuming if you're watching from the US. Now, um, so this is not something that you that you treat lightly. There is a practical uh, and monetary cost involved. Uh, not, only are gonna, not only are you going to lose the 100 bucks or whatever uh, it costs to replace this, plus replace your saw blade, it's also just gonna take time. Uh, you're gonna, if you don't have a, a backup cartridge on hand, if you don't have, don't have a backup blade on hand, you're going to have to go to the store and get replacement ones, and not everywhere carries these particular cartridges. If you're in some uh, small remote town or something that, uh, you know, doesn't, they, that you don't have a place that sells these, uh, actually, when I had to replace mine, I had to drive down to Eugene, which is about a, you know, 45 minute drive from here or so. The, no, no, no stores in my area carried them. So, um, so that was basically, you know, two hours there and back, uh, there and back for round trip. And so that was time that I lost that day uh, when I was planning on doing some shock work. Uh, so there is a practical, not only a monetary cost, but a practical co uh, cost involved. It simply takes time. You got to buy a replacement blade and cartridge. You have to go do whatever travel involved that's, that's involved in doing that. You have to actually physically install the new blade and cartridge, which, you know, installing a saw blade isn't the worst thing. Um, there's certainly more uh, time consuming shop, uh, you know, maintenance things out there, but it take, does take some time. And uh, so there is a cost with that. Again, uh, sorry for that aside, I just thought it would be necessary to describe the most common electronic safety mechanism, mechanism used in table saws. Uh, if you talk about active safety uh, systems on table saws in the woodworking community, most people are probably going to think of a saw stop. It is the most uh, widely deployed one out there, although there may be some other ones as well. Uh, I know, I believe there was another one, the Bosch uh, React system, well, which I believed work in a, worked in a similar way. Although if I remember correctly, if I understand it, I believe they may have stopped making them for one reason or another. Though I believe the stop, the stop, stop patents uh, recently expired. So maybe we'll see more competitors adopting this kind of technology in the future. But really all of this is background for what I really want to talk about today, which is the Altendorf system. 
so uh, why am I putting together such a long video essay about a table saw? Uh, Sawstop has been making their saws for over two decades at this point. Uh, what's the big deal about another company doing it? So the reason I'm talking about this is not simply because of the fact, uh, the fact that Altendorf has a new safety mechanism. If it worked very similar to the, uh, to the saw stop system, I really wouldn't have any concerns. It's just more, it's just another company uh, taking advantage of expired patents or coming up with their own similar system. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied with this tech, type of technology. I'm pretty confident in it. If another company wants to do something like that, I wouldn't really have any concerns. But again, I suggest you watch the video from 731 Woodworks and check out the information on the Altendorf site, which is linked below. But in summary, it is not, it does not work like the saw stop system does. It is not a capacitance or conductivity based system. Uh, rather, it is a uh, visual recognition system. It is a machine learning system. Basically, it has a pair of cameras uh, uh, positioned above the uh, top of the table saw uh, table and it looks down on the surface from above and it uses and basically as you move your hand back and forth across the surface of the table saw it tries to track the location of that hand uh, using a machine learning algorithm so it continuously records a video of the uh, table saw surface from above and uses a machine learning algorithm to detect hands arms and detect where a hand is and it even it does it, it does have really one really neat feature which is a visual feedback system so if your hand is far from the blade, the blade guard slash dust, collect slash, uh, dust collector is lit up with a green light. If you're getting close, it lights up yellow. If too close, it lights up red. And past some critical distance, it, op it operates a safety system. And uh, this safety system is a little bit different than saw stop. Uh, the saw stop system, because it's a conductivity capacitance based system, it only activates uh, right when your hand actually comes in direct physical contact with the blade. It has no way of detecting when your finger is like here, your finger actually has to touch the table saw blade. Um, but the Altendorf system, it is triggered uh, when your hand gets really close to the blade or when it's visual system, when it's uh, machine vision system detects that your hand is past some critical distance. And because of this, it it gives the saw more time to react. It still needs to move very quickly on human scales. It needs to move the blade down uh, below the top of the top surface of the table saw table uh, in the time it takes your hand to move one or two inches. Now, if you're moving your hand around, you know, one or two inches is a very short amount of time. But again, compared to the saw stop system, which has to, act, has to activate in just a couple milliseconds, this is an eternity by comparison. So, and this allows them to use a much less destructive system to drop the table saw blade below the surface of the saw. Uh, instead of having to use a spring-loaded brake mechanism that jams the brake right up into the surface of the, or the edge of the table saw uh, blade and just, uh, you know, catastrophically destroying both of them, it can instead use a high-speed uh, motor-powered mechanism to lower the blade below the table. It does need to move quickly. It's not something that just, you know, it's not, it, you can, if you see the video, it it is very quick. It's it's like blink of an eye type quick, but uh, not something probably not something quite as fast as the saw stop. It needs to move quickly, but it's still slow enough that you don't have to use this really violent spring loaded mechanism. And again, it's very rapid on a human scale, and apparently quite a startling thing to witness, as was reported in the, in the uh, 731 uh, Woodworks video, but it is non-destructive. In other words, you don't destroy your saw blade, and it doesn't require a single-use cartridge like this one, so you don't have to buy a new one. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, destroy anything, it doesn't jam anything, it simply drops down. Uh, and, and, and in terms of resetting it, getting back to work, uh, there's no, you know, driving to the store and there's no getting new brake cartridges, there's, there's no getting a new blade. All you have to do is press a reset button and in just, you know, 15 seconds, the uh, saw blade motor reverses and it just pops itself right back above the surface of the uh, table and you're good to go. Uh, literally just a single button press and the thing is uh, reset. So the appeal seems obvious. It's a safety system with little cost to operate and it won't and it won't disrupt your workflow. 
you know, at first glance, it's actually a huge improvement over the soft slab system. Again, this requires a expensive, you know, relatively expensive single use cartridge. It destroys your blade in the process. And, you know, blades can be quite expensive. To, you know, they get their 20 bucks up to thousands. But I don't know if I've actually seen a table slab blade that's in the thousands of dollars, but it wouldn't surprise me if uh, there are some out there, probably especially for production environments. The potential benefits are myriad. Again, what's not to like? Now, one obvious downside is just the sheer cost of the system. The system is on a table saw that starts at around 50,000 US dollars. Well, this is true. Um, this is not actually a downside I'm particularly concerned with. Uh, the system, in terms of hardware, if you think about it, it's just a couple cameras pointed down at a, at, you know, at the top of a table saw. Uh, and cameras are cheap. Computer chips are cheap. Uh, I see no reason that tech like this can't eventually work, work its way down into far cheaper products. Uh, saw, saw stop it themselves started out on, started out only selling extremely expensive uh, professional grade cabinet saws, and then as time has gone on, it has gradually moved into cheaper and cheaper devices. Uh, first moving to uh, you know job site saws, and now it even offers its tech on some comparatively cheaper uh, comparatively cheap benchtop saws. And even if a tech, uh, even if a company with like revolutionary technology uh, refuses to ever offer that technology on any cheaper products, even if they just dig in their heels and say, no, we only make $50,000 saws, that's the only thing we ever want to make, and we are never going to license this tech or anything, well, patents don't last forever. Uh, even if Altendorf decides that they never want to sell any cheaper saws, they don't want to license their tech out to other manufacturers, well, with their cooperation or not, patents will expire eventually. But regardless, eventually, one way or another, it will find its way onto uh, other saws offered at a, pro offered at a price point, uh, you know, affordable for ordinary carpenters, contractors, and hobbyist woodworkers. Eventually, you, you can, and it, it's almost inevitable that eventually you may find this technology on the type of saws that you can buy at, you know, a big box store like Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, etc. So if the cost doesn't concern me, well, what does? Well, you can probably guess uh, from, you know, the title of the video and some previous discussions, but if not, what has me concerned is the core mechanism of it, the machine vision system itself. All right, so let's talk in general about how these machine learning and machine vision systems work in comparison to traditional uh, programming methods. So uh, let's look at uh, sort of, on maybe on one hand, I can say uh, traditional programming. And then we have more machine learning based programming. So uh, at a high level, ultimately both of these work by having some sort of input and some sort of output. at the very most basic highest level. However, this middle step is very different between the two of them. So if you have a traditional uh, system, and I'm gonna use the saw stop system as an example. So um, your input in the saw stop, sta saw stop safety system, uh, of course, I don't know the exact details of the uh, mechanism behind it, but I'm gonna talk about this you know, in very general terms. So you might have a sensor that, say, uh, once a millisecond gives the computer a reading of capacitance or conductivity or some other electrical property. So in this case, your input would be a capacitance or conductivity measurement. And I'll just say, you know what, I'll just call it uh, an electrical measurement to be uh, nice and generic. And that is then fed into whatever code is running within the uh, SAWS mechanism. And this code is not, uh, is not grown or trained like it would be in a machine learning system. Instead, it's manually programmed. And uh, the, obviously, what I'm going to show is a very uh, incredibly simplified uh, version of what code must actually be in the saw stop system. But uh, if you want to look at, if you want to talk about this in a very general sense, we could, uh, you know, very, very, very generally model this as perhaps like a simple if statement um, based on this electrical measurement. And we could say something like if 
the measurements, whatever that may be, again, whether we're talking about conductivity, capacitance, et cetera, is greater than some critical value. Uh, if it is, uh, if yes, trigger the mechanism, the mechanism that causes the saw blade to, uh, that causes the brake to act activate and uh, jam up into the saw blade, and also causing the blade to drop below the table of the saw. So if yes, trigger, if no, uh, do nothing. And you'd have a fairly straightforward set of uh, probing, uh, set, a fairly simple set of instructions uh, that are, you are commanding the saw to perform. And again, this is manually programmed. Obviously, it would not be this simple. There's a lot of other, uh, you would not base uh, such a system on a single line of code, obviously. There'd be a lot more uh, involved. But the key is, is that all of it is manually created. Some human being actually sat down and wrote out um, how they want to be the sob to behave. And they wrote a set of commands that would cover all conceivable circumstances. And they can do that because the possible set of circumstances is very limited. You would have, you know, two, you know, one, two, maybe three sensors that are determining how the saw is, uh, what state the saw is in, and based on that, the finite number of combinations or the finite uh, set of uh, input variables, your code is then outputting a set of um, commands to the actual uh, braking mechanism. And uh, again, this is manually, the key here is that this is manually coded so that uh, you, uh, it, is, it is fully human readable, it's fully human vettable, and uh, you know everything this saw is going to do. It's not gonna do some random uh, thing that no one foresaw because it was all manually programmed. Also, um, it, again, and again, the uh, the actual measurements that you're dealing with, you're talking about sensors with a set with a uh, a known set of possible outputs from the sensors to become the inputs to your code, and that's what allows you to have a saw that behaves in a very predictable manner. And that's sort of how traditional programming works, where you, you where you have a so backing up, looking at this at a high level, what this code is going to do is once every millisecond, it's going to go through a loop. It's going to check what the reading of the um, of whatever sensors it's using are, and based on some internal logic, it's going to then output a uh, decision whether to activate the mechanism or not activate the, me the mechanism. And that's really all that's going on in a set of in a uh, traditionally programmed system like what you have inside uh, a saw stop mechanism. Now, uh, let's compare this to something that's based on machine learning. Which, the, which any machine vision system like what you have in the Altendorf system would be. So what do you want to happen? Well, ideally what you want to happen, again, backing up to the uh, description of this uh, machine vision based uh, so, uh, safety mechanism, what you want this to do is to say, okay, well, uh, if we could, we would traditionally program this and say, if uh, hand is less than say one inch away from the blade, uh, then trigger uh, the mechanism, which will drop the saw below the, will drop the blade below the surface of the table. So if this was something that we could easily measure, it would be fairly straightforward to program. We could just say, look, if the hand is within an inch of the blade, drop it down. And that would be the ideal. But you can probably see the problem with this, which is that we don't have a way of determining, you know, we don't have a very direct way of determining how close the hand is to the blade. With something like, like a direct, a direct uh, capacitance or conductivity measurement, like what's based in the saw sub system, uh, there is a the, the sensor that is determining that is giving the computer chip inside the saw a, a continuous direct reading. And all it has to do is look at that number and say, okay, well, is it above a certain value? Is it a below a certain value? It can monitor that directly. There's no fuzzy logic going on. It's just directly measuring it and behaving accordingly. And ideally, we would do something like this with, you know, a, with the visual system as well. But what does this mean if hand is less than one inch? So all we've really done is transform one uh, vague problem into another vague problem. Because how do we actually figure this part out here? 
how do we know if the hand is less than one inch from the saw blade? So you'd have something like, if the hand is less than one inch from the saw blade, uh, drop the drop the, the saw blade with the surface. If it is uh, above, you know, or greater than one inch from the blade, uh, don't activate the dropping mechanism. Or, uh, in, or and there'd be some other logic that says, you know, display a, a red light, a yellow light, a green light, depending on how far, uh, how uh, far the, uh, the hand is, a hand is from the saw blade. But again, the problem with this is that. Unlike the electrical measurement, we do not have a simple number. We do not have a, we do not have some sensor that can directly, without any kind of conversion, tell us how far the hand is from the saw blade. So really, what we've done is we might have some you know hand coded uh, logic at the end of the thing that's actually going to activate the mechanism, but we've now created a new problem, which is how do we know where the hand is? I can use some simple logic to tell the saw, uh, the, or the saw can use some simple logic to, to say, okay, well, if the hand is less than one inch or whatever the critical distance they use uh, from the spinning saw blade, go ahead and drop the saw blade down. But we do not have some simple sensor that can tell us how far away the uh, hand in question is from the saw. Instead, we have only a, uh, a camera reading. We have a couple cameras looking from uh, above onto the, the uh, table saw uh, surface, and those are monitoring it, and they have to, the, the computer has to have some way of turning that visual input into a measurement that describes how far away a hand is uh, from the uh, saw blade. And that's what we're gonna look at next. Okay, so uh, we, ha we need to create a machine vision system that will tell us, uh, based on an input, uh, based on an input video stream, how far away a hand is from a spinning sa table saw blade. So again, we need a machine vision system that does this. Its input is going to be a video feed. And its output is going to be a measurement of how close a hand is at its closest point to a saw blade. Um, we can just say the location of a hand. And uh, we can, uh, now I, I can just, uh, I, I know you mentioned previously that we were talking about the uh, distance from a, a hand to a saw blade, but if you know the location of the hand, uh, finding the distance to a fixed saw blade is pretty trivial. That's just some basic, uh, some basic math, uh, some basic Pythagorean theorem, you're good to go. So really our problem that we need to know is, or our core problem is that we have a, a input video feed, well, two cameras actually, but let's just say, let's just keep it simple and say we have one camera and we have an input video feed and we want an output uh, for the location of a hand. And uh, so what is ultimately a uh, video feed? Well, a video feed, if you think about it, is just nothing more than a big grid of pixels. That's all it is. Just a whole bunch of pixels with a bunch of, uh, you know, with a, uh, for, at, at, at each pixel, there is a, uh, a sensor for color and for uh, light intensity. And that's gonna tell you that ultimately that, that is all a uh, video feed is. So every, you know, certain number of fractions of a second, whether it's 60 frames per second, 30, whatever it might be, uh, the camera is giving the, the computer system a, uh, a video feed, a set of pixels saying, this is what, uh, this is your current data set which is just a large collection of pixels. And from this large set of pixels, this computer needs to somehow uh, determine the location of a hand. And how do you do that? How do you actually program a computer to do that? It's not a simple problem. Um, in fact, there is probably not a explicit system that you can just program into a um, that you can just program into a uh, computer. There is no combination of if statements and uh, you know for statements and while statements that you can somehow uh, output a uh, you know define the location of a hand. It's a, a hand is simply too complex of an object for a uh, a computer to or for you to define in a simple mathematical way. I mean, if you if you tr you know you could try to define I mean, we could come up with ways of defining it like, oh, it has five fingers, it's approximately, you know, it has a, a, a shape that's 
roughly a square circle and for the palm it, you know they're splayed out at certain angles but when you start thinking about the variety of hands that can exist on the human body and the way those can be positioned like looking down from above a hand's going to look very different if i'm holding it at an angle if i'm holding it flat if, it's, if i'm looking at it from the left if i'm looking at it from the right uh you know if my fingers are close together if they're splayed out if i'm wearing a ring if i'm not wearing a ring if i'm wearing long sleeves if i'm not wearing long sleeves there are a lot of different ways for a hand to look and of course you know you, you it can be positioned at any location along the surface of the table saw. Um, also, hands can come in different sizes. They, uh, you know, depending on the person, depending on uh, things like age and, uh, you know, uh, so just height and uh, genetics and, uh, you know, weight and body fat and all sorts of things, hands come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. If you are trying to track the location of an object, like, uh, like if I wanted to track a you know, a, a, on a uh, flat plane, a simple shape like a circle that, uh, you know, is all, if, if I wanted to have a system that could like, you know, track a two inch diameter red circle, and that's all I wanted to track, well, that's something I might be able to explicitly program with, you know, direct human programmed logic, although even that might have some difficulties. Um, but these things are so complex that there is no way to manually program uh, how to teach a computer or to tell a computer uh, the location of a hand. It, the, again, we need some code, some weird logic, some set of instructions that a computer can say, okay, well, based on a image that I'm giving it, again, a big set of pixels in a grid, where, it, well, one, is a hand present, and two, where is that hand? And, you know, draw a box around it, and then use that to uh, determine how far it is from the saw, and then use that to um, determine uh, whether to uh, trigger the safety mechanism or not. So, how do you get this crucial uh, question mark? And the way you get that is through machine learning. Now, uh, the actual computer scientists or uh, computer engineers uh, who may be watching this are probably going to cringe, probably going to really cringe when they watch this. So this is a uh, a simple uh, civil engineers, a poor civil engineers uh, description of machine learning. So uh, I am going to include uh, descriptions or a link uh, to uh, Robert, Mi Robert Miles's channel in the uh, description below. If you want to have uh, want to see more descri uh, better descriptions of machine learning that I could ever give, um, I suggest you check out his channel. Again, this is going to be a very, very, very extremely approximate description of machine learning, um, but hopefully I'm not too far off the mark. But uh, again, if you want a real description of it, uh, you can check out his channel, and I'm sure there are plenty, and, and of course there are plenty of other machine learning channels uh, on YouTube that I would encourage you to look at. Machine learning, the actual, algorith uh, the actual algorithms involved are an incredibly complex thing. In fact, you can get your entire, you can actually get an entire PhD in the field of machine learning. And in fact, I know some people getting their PhDs in machine learning. It's a very complex, very dynamic field and does have a lot of really cool and very uh, great and wonderful applications. Um, and we're gonna talk about a few of them uh, later in the video. But um, right now, I just wanna give a very brief overview of machine learning, which is the process that you use to get this question mark some sort of code that can let us go from a set of pixels to the location of a hand. Well, so in order to do this, we need to have some way of defining what a hand is. And again, we cannot tell it directly what a hand is because a hand is too complex and the number of possible hands is too complex. So instead we use algorithms or really computer scientists have developed algorithms that allow us to teach a machine uh, what meets certain qualifications. So fundamentally how this might work, and there's different ways you could do this, but one obvious way you could do this would be to say, okay, well, let's get a bunch of images of hands. Let's get thousands, you know, hundreds, thousands or more images of hands. Let's get lots of images of hands. And then feed this through a machine learning algorithm. Uh, and I, you know what I'll just call it a, oh, that'll work, a machine learning algorithm. So it's gonna go into this, some sort of uh, process that's going to analyze a bunch of hands, and then from that, 
create another piece of code that will be able to recognize the location of a hand. So we have this machine learning algorithm that based on our input training data is going to output a some a big set of code that will allow us to uh, code to um, track the location of a hand. Ultimately, what we are doing here is we are using code to create code. Uh, we do not know how to create this particular set of code uh, to track the location of a hand. So instead, we have a, a, a machine vision algorithm that's going to look at a whole bunch of pictures and uh, track the location of a hand. And it's not, it is not only a matter of just giving it a bunch of pictures of hands. Really what I might do is I might get a whole bunch of pictures, some of, that ha some of them that have hands, some of them that do not have hands, and the ones that do have hands, I'm going to draw a very poorly rendered hand here. You know, I'll have an image that has, you know, a incredibly poorly drawn hand here. Oh my god, this looks like a paw. I cannot draw to save my life. <laughs> this looks like a sunflower. Um, okay, so you have images that have, you have some picture that has a hand in it, and I get a whole bunch of, I get a couple hundred or a couple thousand images of hands, and I have people go through, I have some, or either I go through, or I have some go through, and we just go and trace the outline of the hand. Because ultimately, that's what we would like the computer to do. Uh, in this particular application, we don't care about uh, you know every detail of the hand. We just want to know the outline of the hand. We want to know the outer bounds of it. Because uh, we don't need to track every little thumbnail and every little you know crease and fold and, and every joint. We just need to know you know what the outline of the hand is. So we will have a we'll, we'll feed it a bunch of data on images of hands and outlines you know, defined by a, a set of points on a, that define a line. Um, we will define the outer outline of a hand, and based upon this, it's going to churn through a bunch of combinations of code. And so what it'll do is it will like it will try some randomly developed set of code. And it might go and you know first randomly try some standard algorithm, and it will see okay well this is if, by trying this one algorithm that's you know twenty percent accurate, and then it's but it's, but then it will say well I can probably do better, and so it will try tweaking that slightly, and you know it'll, it'll make a random change to this algorithm that it's trying to develop, and. Uh, it will then uh, it will then determine okay did, did that random change improve it or uh, or make it more accurate or less accurate and if it made it more accurate it will keep that change if it made it less accurate it will uh, discard that change and you can also do things like having uh, reproductive or uh, evolutionary type algorithms where you know it'll try different out again this machine learning algorithm is the code that we are trying to use to create this other piece of code and you know if it has two different algorithms that, that kind of work well by themselves it can try com combining the, the two algorithms together you know kind of in the way like uh, you know genetic sexual reproduction works um, and so a lot of this is based in kind of evolutionary principles but it, again this is a very high level uh, overview of how machine learning works, and I am probably and I am absolutely doing it doing it a disservice. Um, but again, I would encourage you to look up Robert Miles's channel or some other uh, channels out there uh, for a better introduction to machine learning. But the real key thing here is that all of this is based on your training data. So this code, this machine learning algorithm that is creating the code that we're going to use in the saw to determine where a hand is, it doesn't know the world. It doesn't know anything about the universe. It doesn't know anything what a, about what a human being is. It doesn't know that we have bodies. It doesn't know that we exist in a three-dimensional world. It doesn't know that there's a planet called Earth and what that even means. It doesn't know that it is a, a piece of code running on a computer chip inside a table saw. All it knows of the universe is this set of pixels. That's all it knows. That's all. Again, it has no. It has no conception of what a hand is. It doesn't know that a hand has bones. It doesn't know that a hand has flesh. It doesn't know that a hand has blood and muscle and sinew and all the other things that go into a hand. All it knows about a hand is the video feed. So, um, I better make sure my training data is right and can properly capture all possible hands that that this saw might encounter. Otherwise, I'm going to have a problem because again. The only thing this code knows about hands in the entire universe, and only th the only thing it knows at, at, about anything, is the, is the set of images that I give it in its training data. 
So ultimately, with these machine learning algorithms, while they are very useful, they all operate on the same principle of garbage in, garbage out. And there are a whole bunch of different, you know, there's a whole, again, this is a whole field. You can go get your PhD in if, this if you want. I am vastly simplifying and I'm, I'm really doing this a disservice, I know. Um, but the core idea here is that you are, what I really want you to understand is that this code, the code that is actually going to live in the saw and track the location of a human hand, no one, no human being ever actually coded this. A machine coded this, and, it, and the machine itself wasn't wasn't a conscious entity that was you know writing code. It was just doing by trial and error, uh, creating an algorithm based on a large set of input data, and based upon that set of input data and a whole lot of you know millions of cycles of trial and error, it tries to create an algorithm to uh, uh, track the location of a hand, and that is ultimately what's going on at an extremely high level uh, in machine vision systems. And I guess you know if that's if the, again if if you're a computer scientist, you are absolutely cringing right now, but this is one civil engineer's attempt at describing how these machine vision systems work. The key things to keep in mind are that no human being actually programs these. Uh, a machine learning algorithm is going to, based on a set of trading data that we give them, and in this, and in this case, it's a large set of images of hands, uh, arms, etc. Based upon that, it's going to randomly and using uh, you know random chance and evolutionary processes create a piece of code that will be able to uh, track uh, the location of a hand. And ultimately, the, the quality of this algorithm is going to be based on the uh, quality of the input data. So for example, um, if I gave it, imagine if I gave it a very poor uh, training set of data, uh, set of training data. Like for example, imagine if I, uh, instead of taking images of actual human hands, I just like printed out a bunch of copies of my own hand for some reason. And uh, just, you know, I, I literally printed out like a cardboard cutout of my own hand and took pictures of it at different locations on the saw and used that as my training data. Well, that would have all sorts of problems because the image that I took, uh, the picture that I took of my hand from above, that's just from one angle. And you know, I'm putting it at different locations on the saw. It's not going to be able to grasp the full, full three dimensionality of that uh, problem space. And it's not even, of course, going to begin to understand all possible hands that might exist. Ultimately, the key thing, to, the, the real key thing that I want you to know about this is that this is all based on training data. And the quality of your training data is going to directly determine the quality of the code used to track the to track uh, a hand in the actual system that is present in the saw. Again, I'm probably doing a real disservice to machine learning and machine vision, but th this is the key thing to keep in mind, which is that garbage in is garbage out, and the quality of all of this is based on the quality of the training data that we are giving this piece of code that is going to actually create the, the piece of code that lives in the saw and determines where a hand exists, where a hand is on the surface of the table saw, and then which of them will be used to determine the distance to the blade, which will then be used to determine whether it should uh, trigger the mechanism to drop the table saw blade uh, below the surface of the table. All right, so that is a very, very poor introduction to machine learning and machine vision. But the key thing to keep in mind is, again, all this is based on your training data, garbage in, garbage out. And the quality of your training data is going to directly determine the quality of your tracking system that you, that, that saw uses to determine the location of a hand relative to, to a saw blade in the, on the table saw. So uh, now that we've talked about the difference between, say, conventional programming and machine learning, uh, let's talk more about the uh, Altendorf system. Now, why is this so hard? Isn't uh, identifying a hand as a hand uh, the easiest thing in the world? Again, remember what this thing, what this system has to be able to do is, uh, I'm, again, I'm not concerned about the uh, mechanism to actually lower the saw blade below the surface of the table saw. That seems, you know, challenging to create a motor that can act that quickly and with that amount of reliability, but that seems within normal, um, well-established mechanical design principles. I'm not at all worried about that. What I am concerned with is the machine vision system, the hand tracking, that kind of thing, uh, that I, I'm concerned with the system that allows the saw to know whether a hand is within a certain critical distance of a spinning saw blade. So again, why is this hard? Isn't identifying a hand as a hand and its location the easiest thing in the world? I mean, I mean, 
I have hands. You can, I can move my hands around and you can track them and see them and say, okay, well, what her right hand's over here, her left hand's over here. It's not the easiest thing in the world. In fact, I bet I could show almost any human being uh, in the world various pictures, uh, some with hands in them and some without, and ask them to point out the hands in the pictures, sort of like a, you know, a captcha for hands. And uh, almost any uh, healthy human could, per could perform that task with near 100% accuracy, uh, assuming no disabilities uh, or inebriation or mind-altering substances, that kind of thing. And really, it doesn't matter what type of hand. Uh, for most normal human beings, identify identifying a hand as a hand is just beyond trivial. And it doesn't matter the type of the hand, uh, male, female, young, old, adult, child, uh, pick a racial or ethnic group, it doesn't matter. Wearing gloves or not wearing gloves, good light, poor light, it doesn't matter. A hand is a hand. Uh, unless the person in an image that I'm showing you and asking you to identify the hand is wearing some sort of elaborate costume that makes their hand, you know, completely unrecognizable as a hand, almost any human being would be able to do that trivially, uh, just with no effort whatsoever. You know, a hand is a hand. You can tell what a hand is. Or imagine this. Uh, let's look at something a bit more, uh, let's consider something a bit more comparable to what, this, what the Altendorf system is doing. Uh, I could put you in front of any, almost any human being on earth and ask that other person to dance around, ask them to move about, you know, move their hands around, you know, dance up and down, twirl around, whatever it might be, and ask you to just do one simple task as this person moves around. Ask you to point at their hand. Just as I'm moving around, just imagine pointing at my hand. That's again, a trivial task. That would be, again, person with, of, you know, any kind of, you know, there's a little bit, there's a large range of human faculties and abilities, but that is such a trivial task for almost anyone with functioning eyes and functioning mental faculties. That is just a, that is beyond trivial. So surely it should be easy for your machine to do that, to do that as well. Why would it be hard uh, to identify where a hand is? Again, hands are simple things in terms of shapes. Um, obviously, the a hand is a very complicated, very finely tuned, uh, finely evolved, uh, you know, mechanism. There's all sorts of little pieces in there. That, that it's really a fascinating thing. Um, but you know, in terms of identifying the shape of a hand, isn't that just absolutely trivial? But this is a case where we need to be very very careful not, pro not to project our own human biases onto the world at large. So we as humans will think that identifying a hand as a hand is a trivial thing. And for us, it is. But again, what is true for our minds is not necessarily true for the world at large or for uh, a computer. So first of all, uh, why is this so? First of all, our minds are far, far more powerful than we tend to give them credit for. There will always exist a temptation to consider computers to be innately smarter than humans. Uh, in terms of certain things, they certainly are. My computer can perform mathematical computations way faster than I can, and it's not even close, many orders of magnitude. You sit me down with a pen and paper and ask me to perform, you know, arithmetic, my ca my, even, a, even a computer that was, you know, that came out from long before I was born, even a computer from the 1950s could, you know, just absolutely smoke any human in hand computations. But we need to be careful again, not to look at one case and project that to everything. And if you think about it deeply, this really isn't a fair comparison. So uh, why is this? When I'm doing mental arithmetic, and which again, computers are far better at humans at, um, think about how I'm doing that. I don't have some part of my subconscious mind that can do computations. I have to consciously think about, okay, well, you know, three times eight is 32. I guess there's some memorization built into it if you learned your times tables and things. Um, but it is a conscious process. We don't have, there is no, there is no like sub part of the brain, some substructure of the brain that's dedicated to doing, to solving integrals or performing multiplication or division. We have to use our, we have no choice but to use our conscious minds as we do perform calculations. And the human mind is an interesting thing in that the conscious part of it, the, con the part of your brain that deals with, you know, you, your thinking, your faculties, your, your conscious mind, um, that is only a tiny, tiny fraction uh, of our mental faculties, of our mental capacities. Um, 
So we as biased and flawed human beings, we tend to think like the things that we find most impressive must be the most uh, intellectually rigorous or the most computationally challenging. So we think we, we, we might look at things uh, that animals can't do and conclude that these are the greatest signs of human intelligence. Uh, think like writing and speaking of works of art and poetry, scientific reasoning, uh, or like if you really want to get to the, you know, a grandiose thing, like think of the works of Shakespeare or if discovering E equals MC squared you know and we th and and these are what we consider our greatest intellectual triumphs because in terms of conscious ability uh, these particular examples uh you know shakespeare shakespeare's sonnets and einstein's relativity those had to be figured out by a conscious human mind there's not some portion of the brain dedicated to solving relativity there's no portion of the brain dedicated to you know writing stories well it gets a little more subtle but um so our biases lead us to conclude that these uniquely human things must be the greatest works of pure intellect we can imagine. In other words, they must somehow represent the vast bulk of our mental computations. And from a certain lens, they are. However, human, you know, scientists have studied the mind. Many great and brilliant people have dedicated their entire lives and careers to unlocking it, its mysteries. And it turns out that we are kind of, if we consider, you know, the works of Einstein to be our greatest computational challenges, mental computational challenges, that is just a case of us applying our biases to our own minds. It turns out that these various works of intellect are actually not what we spend the vast, vast majority of our brain power on. And you don't have to be the next Einstein for this to be the case. Uh, if you're a student taking a calc class, a calculus class, and you spend a day solving calculus practice problems, you might conclude that during that day, most of your mental computation, most of your mind, most of your brain itself uh, was dedicated to solving those problems. But really, it turns out the mind is a lot weirder than we ever thought it was. That's actually not the case. That's not how the human mind works. Regardless of what you're concentrating on and, and how hard you concentrate, even if you spend your entire day working on intellectually challenging work, you will actually not spend the majority of your mental capacity on those tasks. If a task is something you can consciously concentrate on, it will never represent a more than a small percentage of your brain's overall processing power. Now, is this because of the old like canard of like you only use 20% of your brain is true? Is there is is that kind of is that is that what I'm getting at? No, far from it. Uh, your brain, your entire brain is useful. Um, there is not some vast well of, you know, uh, untapped potential just waiting to be plumbed. Um, rather, it's because your conscious mind, the part of your uh, mind that deals directly with thinking and reasoning, that's only a small portion of your mind. Your conscious mind is but a, but the, you know, the tip of the proverbial iceberg. And again, this isn't some new age nonsense about metaphysically expanding your brain, you know, opening up a third eye or other kind of, or other such woo. There isn't some vast well of mental capacity just waiting to be plumbed if you meditate just right. Rather, it's because the vast majority of your mind is really needed for just ostensibly mundane everyday tasks. Um, again, think about how the human mind arose. You are not an amorphous, you know, cloud existing in, in space somewhere. Uh, you're not some amorphous spiritual thing living on another planet of existence. You are a creature. You are a human being. You are a creature that has evolved over millions of years to will to live and dwell here. You have you you are the uh, you know the end of this long series of evolution. And you are a creature that has evolved over millions of years to live and dwell as a social organism living in a three-dimensional terrestrial environment. You know, you sit right where you are now. You sit atop a, well, you know, what, I, what, I, what I've heard and uh, uh, love to create, what love to uh, poetically refer to as, uh, you sit atop the four billion year deep corpse pile known as Darwinian evolution. You and all of your ancestors, going back to the, to the, some single cell amoeba, have had to exist, live, eat, reproduce, and die in this same physical world that we live in. There are entire areas of the human brain dedicated to what we consider to be very mundane tasks. Uh, there are parts of the brain just for breathing, just parts of, for uh, sensing pain and temperature, parts for processing visual information and recognizing objects. If I hold this object here up, uh, 
you know what this is. This is a phone. You could call it a smartphone. Uh, if someone, and, and you know, you could go deeper if you are uh, really interested in phones and models and manufacturers. You know, if I took this phone out of its case and showed it to you, you could, you might even, if you were uh, particularly well versed in that, you might even be able to tell me the uh, actual manufacturer model number, etc., or model, etc. You know, we have parts of our brain that do nothing, that are dedicated to nothing but just identifying common objects. Um, so, uh, you know, you have parts of the brain dedicated to uh, doing nothing but identifying faces. Uh, you know, we have a ton of our brain, a big part of our brain that is just to identify faces. That's it. Um, identify faces, the people associated with those faces, and not just that, but the emotional uh, memories associated with them. If, uh, you know, if you see a, you know, you can put someone in an MRI machine and uh, I guess an fMRI machine and, you know, show them a picture of, um, you know, uh, one of their loved ones and their brain, parts of their brain will light up. And, you know, those are the parts of the brain associated with recognizing faces and recognizing uh, emotional content. So like you could show them a picture of a stranger and certain parts of their brain will light up and you could show them a picture of a close family member or a friend and these areas plus some other areas would light up. The uh, parts of the brain that are just about recognizing faces will light up for both of them but the part that that is that goes to recognizing you know individuals that you have emotional ties to those will light up as well if you uh, show someone a picture of a uh, family member or I suppose the same could the same could happen if you so showed a picture of someone to someone uh, that had negative emotions associated with them so uh, or, you know, doing something as simple and mundane as throwing a, bra throwing a ball, uh, walking down a set of stairs, or identifying a common object is, you know, we think of these as simple, simple, simple tasks, but by doing so, we betray their complexity. So, you know, think about how hard you had to work to learn how to walk. You know, uh, I don't think very few of us, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers actually learning how to walk, but if you've ever seen a very young child, an infant, you know, we are not born learning how to walk. It is a, we actually have to work at it. We have to learn, we have to practice, we have to, you, you know, you have to first learn how to crawl, then you sort of, you well, actually first learn how to sit up, then you learn how to crawl, then you learn how to walk, then you how to run. Uh, if you have, in, in, in some people, if you, they have certain injuries or brain damage, they have to go through that whole process all over again. So things that we consider to be very simple and mundane tasks are actually uh, very complicated, sometimes require, you know, immense neural processing, often involving very specialized and purpose dedicated structures in the brain. And also, unlike general purpose computers, uh, you know, a, a computer processor or a graphics card, they are not tuned to a particular task. They are general purpose devices. Uh, but unlike a computer, the parts of our brain that are dedicated to specific tasks, to, to specific tasks, are higher are hardwired to those tasks. Um, again, unlike a general purpose computer, the parts of the brain built for specific tasks are evolved from the cellular hardware up specifically to perform that task with the highest efficiency possible. And we don't. It's not, and it's not like we just identify objects. We don't just walk into a living room and see a chair, a couch, a rug, or a table. When walking into a room, in an instant, we'll not only see and identify those objects, but in our minds, we'll form a complex three-dimensional map of the room, which we can then instantly use to navigate through the room. We fund. In other words, we fundamentally are embodied organisms. We are organisms that have evolved over hundreds of millions and billions of years to exist in a three-dimensional world. We, you know, how we process uh, operating in an environment, how we process recognizing objects, it goes far beyond what happens in just a image, uh, you know, a machine vision system, which just tries to identify the location of a hand-shaped object. It, you know, it's so, uh, there's a lot more depth and a lot more specialization that goes into the human mind or even animal minds. So it is always tempting to view the human mind as independent from our physical form, you know, to see ourselves as this like detached software piloting some sort of meat robot. Or if you want to go more at classical terms, you know, like Cartesian dualism, the mind body problem, etc. Um, you know, and actually the very origin of consciousness remains one of the greatest challenges in science and philosophy, uh, often referred to as the hard problem of consciousness, which, you know, you can look up and it, there's, uh, there have been 
en endless uh, bottles of ink spilled on that topic. Um, but again, your awareness does not exist independently of your body. To see a simple example of that, consider how your physical environment and your personal, you know, uh, physical condition affects your mental state. Think about what happens to your mood when you get really hungry or in the opposite case, when you've just eaten a big meal. Uh, think about how um, uh, your mental state slows down uh, when you get sleepy and your body needs, needs rest. Uh, think of all, the, or, or on a more humorous note, think of all the foolish things human beings have done uh, simply to impress uh, other humans or pursue romantic interests. Ultimately, we are here. We are of this place, this world, this three-dimensional reality. We are ultimately embodied organisms. Our minds, our bodies, our beliefs and actions, you know, our, our minds, beliefs and actions are just as dependent on the physical world as anything else in this universe. So bringing this back to the, the problem of machine vision, you ultimately have something that the machine doesn't. Uh, unlike the machine, you are an embodied being. You are an embodied organism that has evolved over billions of years to exist here, right here on this planet, on this physical world, in this three-dimensional physical universe. This isn't true of a machine vision system. A machine vision system like the one used in the table saw, it doesn't know what an arm is. It doesn't know what a hand is. It doesn't know what it itself is. It doesn't know what a human is and has zero comprehension that it is a piece of code running on a physical computer chip built into a table saw sitting on the ground, which floating on a big ball of molten iron uh, whirling around the big ball of nuclear fire, we call the sun. It doesn't know any of that. It has no, it is not an embodied being or an embodied uh, you know, process. It, it does not have the long evolutionary history that we do evolving in this so intimately tied to this physical world. All it knows at all, all of it know, that it knows at all about our universe are inputs and outputs. That's it. It is given a stream of two, uh, you know, a continuous stream of two dimensional images, you know, coming from the cameras at the top of the uh, table saw. And it's asked to produce a map of something that we would call a hand, but again, it doesn't know what a hand is. It just knows that it's supposed to look for some kind of weird shape that we would call a hand, but has no idea what a hand is. It doesn't, um, it, again, it doesn't know what a hand is. It doesn't know why a hand shouldn't touch a spinning saw blade. Uh, it doesn't know that a hand is made of human flesh. It doesn't know what a human being is. It doesn't know why it's bad for a hand to touch a saw blade. It doesn't have any conception of that. It is it is not an embodied organism living in the world. So um, to get to, to look at this from a different angle, uh, this this is perhaps better illustrated with programs like ChatGPT. And I, I hope you've you know I hope by now you played with them a bit if you could. If not, I really encourage you to because they really illustrate. Uh, how these kind of things actually work. Uh, these programs have sometimes been referred to as confident liars, you know, confident liars. They will, uh, a program like ChatGPT will happily tell you something that is completely false. Um, so they're sometimes referred to as confident liars, but I won't even give them that much credit. Uh, lying implies an intent to deceive. A human being can lie. Uh, you know, I can tell an, one human being something that I know to be false with the intent to deceive them or make them to do something that against their best interests. I am, as a human being, incapable of lying. ChatGPT is not capable of lying. Lying implies an intent to deceive. ChatGPT can't lie to you because it can't even understand that the concept of truth exists. You cannot lie to someone if you don't recognize that there are true things and there are false things. You know, human beings, we tend sometimes get caught in our own like information bubbles and you get like different parties, you know, different political parties forming different versions of the truth. But, at, you know, we don't necessarily all agree on what the truth is, but we all agree that truth can exist. We might not agree on that that truth is, but we do understand that it exists. But a program like ChatGPT, it doesn't understand what truth is. It's just, it's, there is no there there. There is no being there. There is no mind there. It's just a blind, stochastic parrot, a randomized vocal mirror. 
or I guess not, not really vocal, more written. Um, just It's just an elaborate chatbot designed to guess what the next word is based on the training data it's been given. It's why if you ask ChatGPT to write something scholarly and provide sources, it will just make some up. In fact, I actually tried Ch ChatGPT out once. Uh, you know, I was having trouble uh, finding sources for a certain particular thing I wanted to look at in my research product. And I didn't want to get it. I didn't, I wasn't intending to use it to like actually like write a paper or something like that. But I wonder, I thought, okay, well, ChatGPT is trained on this enormous data set across the internet. Maybe I can use it to like find sources that I haven't been able to find, you know, in my uh, searches. Maybe I, maybe it'll find, maybe, it'll, maybe it will be able to think of a search term that I haven't been able to think of, you know, and then I can put that into Google Scholar. And I asked it a certain topic. And it gave me a summary on it. And I asked it to not only give me a topic, but provide sources. But this program, it invented sources. It invented a half dozen different uh, citations for papers that do not exist. It invented authors, human beings that do not exist. It took the names of real authors on papers in a, in a similar field and invented papers that they never wrote. And I know they don't exist because I took them, at, you know, you can, you can take those citations, search them in Google Scholar and other places, and they clearly just don't exist. It simply makes stuff up. Again, it's doing this because it does not recognize that truth exists. It, it is not capable of understanding anything that it's what it what it's talking about it is just a blind chinese room a just it's just regurgitating uh statistically recombined recombobulated pieces of information and text it's found online um again so it will it will happily give you perfectly formatted citations for papers that don't that have never been written that don't exist and again the crazy thing is it's not lying to you it doesn't know that these papers doesn't don't do not exist it doesn't even know what it means for a thing to exist uh if i say if i ask you does a paper exist well what that implies to you is, did a human being, or I suppose maybe a sh machine, if you want to get uh, more sci-fi, did something, someone actually write that? Or if I ask you, does this cert if I ask you, does Bigfoot exist? Well, most people probably don't think Bigfoot exists. I don't, but maybe some people do. And if you do, I guess, well, I mean, more power to you, I suppose. But at least we can agree on what the question, does Bigfoot exist, means. Uh, if I ask you, does Bigfoot exist? What I'm asking is, if I went out into the woods and had infinite time and I could, you know, if I was like the Flash or, or Superman and I could just like, you know, walk through or fly through all of the forests in the Pacific Northwest and just literally with my own eyes scout out the entire thing, would I see a big, giant, hairy primate, you know, eight foot tall uh, ape man living in the woods somewhere? That's what it means when I say the question, does Bigfoot exist? But ChatGPT can't understand that. It does not understand the concept of something existing. So again, ChatGPT and programs like it, they have no sense of the physical world. There is no there there. There is no being there. There is no mind behind it. It's just a bunch of blind statistics churning out highly tuned Mad Libs. Or uh, for another example, consider image generation programs like Midjourney, Dolly, etc. Uh, even ignoring the very real copyright issues and problems of, you know, the stolen work that went into training a lot of them, they also have no conception of the physical world. Uh, do you remember how these programs have struggled so much with fingers? Uh, they're infamous for producing uh, realistic looking humans in some cases, except their hands are these Lovecraftian nightmares of twisted mangled digits or hands with absurd numbers of fingers growing at horrifying angles. Uh, and I know some of them have gotten better. And, you know, if you watch this video a couple of years from now, I imagine that those problems will have largely been solved. Uh, but do you know why that is? Do you know why they have problems with that? Because look at the human hand. Five fingers. I guess there are some people who have more or less fingers. Uh, but in most, in most, in almost all cases, five fingers. So ask yourself, for the typical finger, you know, how many fingers does the typical finger have adjacent to it? Well, this is an interesting statistical thing, but if you think about it, like 60% of fingers have two adjacent fingers. In other words, my pinky finger has one adjacent finger. My ring finger has two adjacent fingers. My middle finger has two adjacent fingers. My index finger has two adjacent fingers. And my thumb has one adjacent finger. And so 60% of fingers have 
two adjacent fingers. So if, if this thing is drawing a hand, well, it'll start by drawing a finger and then it says, okay, well, most fingers have two adjacent fingers. So I guess I need another finger over here. And oh, I just drew this finger. Well, uh, most fingers have two fingers next to them. So I guess I'll need to draw another finger and so on and so on. Um, so uh, again, the typical uh, finger has other fingers to the right and the left of them. So when the machine tries to draw a hand, it applies its statistical madness and, and it ends up creating hands with, you know, a dozen fingers on it. Now, do not get me wrong. Uh, machine learning tools and machine vision tools have their place. Uh, for example, ChatGPT can be quite useful as a source of inspiration. Uh, you might use it to get past the blank page problem where the hardest part is just, you know, starting a report for something. But if you're just trying to get some inspiration for a story or something like that, that might have some uses. Uh, or there are programs like uh, AI Dungeon, which use, you know, some similar generative text tools to generate like a continuous RPG based on your inputs. Uh, so you might use ChatGPT and programs like it for some initial inspiration and then begin your writing from there. Although for the record, this script uh, for this video was not prepared with any machine learning tools whatsoever. And I'm not being ironic, this was whew, all handwritten. Well, written on in Word if you're curious. Um, anyway, so... Um, uh, in, and also in regards to machine learning, any machine vision system also has its place. So I'm familiar with its use in some areas of civil engineering and forestry. So for example, uh, some lumber mills will use machine vision. You know, a lumber mill, you have like long, you know, factory type assembly lines of, you know, you start with a log on one end and you get two by fours or two by sixes or plywood or whatever it might be on the other end. And there's all sorts of milling processes that go in uh, along this line uh, to turning a raw log into useful lumber products. And part of that process is uh, grading lumber. Like they're, they're, you know, Wood is a biological material. There are only, um, you know, some pieces of lumber are just not going to be useful for anything other than firewood. And so, you know, and some have different grading, the different gradings, the different ratings. Um, so you need to have ways of rating and grading individual pieces of lumber. So some, you know, traditionally this is done by trained uh, experts, you know, lum people whose job title is literally lumber grader. Uh, and some mill, but but in modern times, some lumber mills uh, will use machine vision to automatically grade pieces of lumber running through a mill's line. Uh, they'll use machine um, a machine vision tool to count the number of knots, cracks, checks, degrees of warping, etc., uh, in a piece of lumber, and they will then sort piece, uh, pieces of lumber into an appropriate grade. And really, that is an excellent use of of, of machine vision. Uh, there's been a lot of research in developing uh, this, these tools, and a lot of uh, a lot of research has gone into developing these things for other applications like uh, recycling plants. And this has also been used a lot in the civil engineering infrastructure context. So, for example, you can put a video camera on top of a traffic light and use it to detect uh, when cars approach and trigger the stoplight cycle accordingly. Uh, traditionally, if you have uh, well you know, old, 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 olden days, uh, stoplights wouldn't have any sensors whatsoever. Well, I guess if you go back far enough, there'd be like a policeman sitting there with a, you know, uh, directing traffic or something in old timey London or something, but you know, 1910s London or something. But if we're talking traffic lights, you know, the oldest ones would just use like, uh, you know, simple fi fixed times that, you know, there's literally just a timer and the green light changes every X number of seconds. Uh, the next more evolved version of that is using, um, is where you have like coils of wire embedded in the road surface and they magnetically uh, or electrically detect or capacitively, I'm not sure exactly how they work, uh, detect when a car, which is largely made of, which is, you know, has a ton of metal in it, when it drives over, it causes a change in the magnetic field of that coil. And that's something the system can detect and uh, if not trigger the light, well, alter the light cycle accordingly. But but the more advanced versions of this, they'll use, they'll put cameras on top of lights and use those to detect uh, when a car is approaching a light and use that to trigger the uh, light cycle. Or if you're doing like road design, uh, you can use, instead of like uh, a lot of things that go into traffic engineering are based on traffic counts. Uh, a traffic count is literally just what it seems like, uh, what it sounds like. You are counting the number of vehicles that go past a uh, a fixed point on the road in a given amount of time. You know how many. The goal is to find out how many cars per hour or cars per day are using a given stretch of road. You're literally counting the cars, and that's a great use for machine vision. Um, 
So, you know, you can get you can get uh, uh, traffic counts for that, and you can use that when designing roads, deciding where to allocate transportation dollars. All of these kind of things are excellent uh, uses of machine vision. However, all of these applications share a very common characteristic, and that is a low consequence of failure. Now, uh, think of that machine vision based traffic light. Uh, you might train it based on a data set of the most common vehicles on the road. Uh, you might train it based on, say, the 10 most common sedans, the 10 most common SUVs, uh, the 10 most common delivery vans, semi trucks, buses, etc. And you use that as your training data set. And that might give you enough data to cover most cases. But there's always going to be some weird edge cases that you didn't think to use in your training data. Uh, so, for example, what happens when an antique car enthusiast uh, rolls up to the light in an old Ford Model T? Uh, what if a dozen people uh, pedal up uh, riding one of those mobile uh, bike pedal bar contraptions you see? Uh, sometimes you'll see them in cities where there's like a like a city bar district where you can rent them for like bachelor parties or something uh, or just pub crawls, that kind of thing. What happens if one of if somebody roll if a group of people roll up in one of those? Uh, will it rec will will your machine vision system uh, recognize that as a vehicle that needs the light to turn? Maybe, maybe not. But what happens if it doesn't? Well, nothing really. Uh, the worst that happens is someone driving an old vehicle, driving that old Model T, uh, has to wait a bit longer than they otherwise would, at, or as other wait longer than they should at that light. Uh, or the bachelor party on the mobile bike bar, uh, really, they won't be too harmed if they have to wait a bit longer or wait until somebody else comes along uh, in a regular vehicle to trigger the light as well. Uh, really, stoplights are an excellent use of machine vision. Uh, nobody's going to be harmed. Nobody's going to die. Uh, nobody's going to get fired from their job or whatever if... Uh, you know, they miss a vehicle as long as the as long as the uh, failure rate is acceptably low. Now, if they miss half of the vehicles that come up to them, then yeah, that's probably an unacceptably high level of failure. But, you know, as long as they're reasonably accurate, uh, and I'm not sure what the actual level of uh, needed accuracy on those is, but there is an acceptable rate of failure. No one's going to be physically going to be seriously harmed if they have to wait a couple extra minutes at a traffic light. Um, but is that the case in all in all cases? Uh, how can these machines? So in in the cases that I've talked about here, like the um, you know the machine vision system on like a at a recycling plant or a lumber mill or the traffic light, if uh, they just need a certain uh, level of reliability, and if they fail, there's not a catastrophic consequence to there. But are other applications where these things can go wrong and can go wrong very badly? So let's talk about that next. There is a line in the old uh, Animatrix uh, that has always stuck with me. If, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the Animatrix, uh, I actually suggest you watch it. It's, it's, it's great. Uh, it's a series of uh, shorts that uh, came out between, I believe it came out between the release of the first Matrix movie and the second Matrix movie. And uh, the, the line I'm thinking of came from one of those uh, referred to as the second renaissance. Uh, sort of, It's sort of like the prequel or the backstory of, uh, sort of describes how the world and the Wachowski's Matrix universe came about. And it's a line that always struck with me as kind of like particularly poetic. And it goes, uh, bless all forms of intelligence, may man and machine be forgiven for their sins. So in a wonderful pontification I've, uh, on my script here, I've titled this section, may man and machine be forgiven for their sins. But uh, anyway, although of course, with the things we're talking about, they cannot think, they cannot uh, reason, they do not exist in the real world. They are not actual beings, so of course they can't sin. Um, although we can talk about metaphysics and what the nature of sin, etc. But let's not worry about that right now. Okay, so let's just talk about instead, uh, getting back to what we were talking about, how can these machine learning systems go wrong? Do we have any evidence of, say, biased training data leading to actual real-world problems? Well, remember, any machine learning system is only as good as its training data. These things are not manually programmed like you would program a traditional computer program. Nobody sat down and typed out all of the code in ChatGPT, you know, the billions of lines of code or whatever it is, millions probably, that allow, that allow it to do what it does. Nobody sat down and figured out how to write code to do that. It was done by a generative AI algorithm. It was, it was trained, or if you want to say, it, if you, you might say it was grown. Um, 
but all of this is based on the training data. So if there is a bias in your training data, there will be a bias in your system's output. And there have been many instances of visual recognition systems that work perfectly fine in testing uh, and work perfectly fine when they're designed, but they fail completely when they're thrown into the real world. Uh, it turns out the real world is a lot more complicated than anything that you can tend to plan for. There's always going to be some edge cases that you haven't considered. Uh, so for example, a common one, uh, for example, race is a common one, you know, skin color, racial ethnic groups, etc. cetera. Um, startups run by tech bros out in Silicon Valley aren't exactly known for being the most diverse lot, um, although they're getting better, et cetera. But um, when, so when designing a visual, uh, you know, a vision uh, recognition system, a machine vision system, uh, companies often use the most convenient source of training data possible, uh, their own employees. So they'll get a bunch of their own employees to perform some action in front of a camera that they're trying to train an AI to do. They'll get some, uh, some, uh, some, a bunch of their employees to perform uh, actions in front of a camera and it works. And then they'll create a uh, system to recognize those and, and, uh, uh, rank at things accordingly and rate, th rate uh, f uh, input videos and p images accordingly. And it works perfectly fine for those employees. Uh, but unbeknownst to them, the software they trained is using correlations that might work well for one gender or one racial group, but not work well for others. Uh, so for example, let's, uh, before we get into some real world examples, let's talk a bit, let's look at uh, a bit of a, a thought experiment. Uh, for example, let's say I'm designing a machine vision system uh, for one of those, uh, you know, automated sliding doors uh, you'll see at grocery stores and other places. I want, a so I want some software that will look at a video feed, detect when a human is present, and open the door. That's all I want it to do. I want it to just be simple. I just want when a human is in front of the door, open the door. I don't want them opening. I don't want the doors opening when nothing is in front of them. I don't want them opening when a squirrel walks past them. I just want them to open for any human whatsoever. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to create a security door that'll only work for me. I'm not trying to do it. I'm not trying to create a door that will only work for adults or won't work for children. I just want a door that opens for human beings. That's it. Something you would install on a grocery store. So how do I do that? Well, I first develop a set of training data. I get a, you know, I mount the camera. Uh, if I, I mean, I have a rig that I, you know, set up in a testing lab. I mount my camera uh, at the same angle and distance as a, uh, as it would be in a real world application at a grocery store or a similar retail outlet. And then I get a bunch of people to walk in front of the camera at the same, in, in, at the same distance that they would as they were, uh, you know, in same gate, etc., that they would as if they were walking into a, uh, a business. I then go through and manually label uh, certain frames as containing humans or not containing humans. I then run an AI system to produce code that will flag whether an image contains a human. Uh, so this software will then continue. So again, I have this big data set of some images that contain humans and some images that don't contain humans. And I train the software accordingly. And then uh, it, it does its little statistical mojo and its statistical magic. And it figures out uh, uh, some black box algorithm that will be able to tell, ideally, whether a human is in frame or not. And then I can then take that piece of software, put it in a device, have it monitor a feed in a, in a real world uh, grocery store or similar, and just look whether humans are in, in the frame. And when a human is in the frame, it tells the door to open. Except remember, this is just a piece of software, a piece of code running on a computer chip. It is not a physical being living in the physical world. It doesn't know what a human is. Uh, it doesn't know, you know, what uh, how big a human is. It doesn't know how the, even the concept of bigness is. It doesn't know uh, uh, how it doesn't know anything about the world. It is just a piece of code running embedded within a computer chip. Um, so again, it didn't know anything about the world. I had to instruct everything it knows. It didn't know what a human being is. I had to tell it. I had to teach it what a human being is. And, uh, you know, you can think of, uh, you know, you can think of famous examples in philosophy of, you know, def the trouble of defining what a human is, you know, you have the famous idea of, uh, you know, a human is a, a, a biped without feathers and the problems of that. But uh, how, how did I actually teach that algorithm what a human is? I didn't, you know, 
I, you know, if I'm trying to teach, if I wanted to teach an alien, like an, an actual physical being that is from another world, what a human is, well, I could show them a bunch of creatures. I could say, okay, well, here's a bunch of humans, here's a bunch of dogs, a bunch of cats, here's an elephant, here's a house, you know, and it would have some understanding of what a human innately is. It would recognize us as biological organisms of a certain size and shape, and it would probably be able to do that pretty accurately because it itself is a physical being in the physical universe. But the program doesn't really work that way. It doesn't know what a human being is. It just knows that I told it that this collection of pixels in a camera uh, or an image is a, a particular uh, set of pixels and shaped in a certain way are human. Again, it didn't know what a human is. I had to teach it. And the only way it has of knowing what a human being is are the images that I gave it. Uh, it can't perform tests. It can't go and like look at humans from different angles. It can't it can't try to pick a human up and see what it weighs. It can't try to shake a human's hand and see what you know human skin or human uh, the the density or stiffness of human flesh is. It can't. It doesn't have any context of that. All it has is Im the images that I gave it to that machine to that code. That is what a human is. So I better be sure I got that right. Because if I didn't correctly teach it what a human being is, it's not going to know what a human being is because it cannot perform any validation or testing on its own. So, but what if there is a bias in my training data? So, uh, for example, let's say I wasn't careful. Uh, maybe I didn't include uh, any or a sufficient number of people or one ethnic or racial group or, or another. Um, maybe I'm doing this as maybe I'm maybe I'm a company, I'm an employer. And as I'm, you know, I'm a startup and I'm building this thing or whatever. And I just am lazy, I get my data set all for my own employees. And because my company is kind of small, I don't have that many employees. So it's really easy for me to have, you know, if you only have a dozen employees, it's very, it's quite possible that you won't have, you know, all of human humanity racial groups represented it among your employees. So it's quite easy to see how that could happen. Um, well, if things go wrong, what does that represent or what, does, what happens to that door that I did not train it uh, on samples of people of all ethnic groups? Well, what the actual consequences of that will depend a lot on how the algorithm works. It may not actually go the, you know quite this catastrophically wrong, but it may. Um, but if things go really wrong, they could go very wrong in the sense that I might actually end up with a door that opens for most people, but refuses to open for people of one particular racial group or another. Imagine that. Imagine trying imagine something so ridiculous, so insane. You have a door that absolutely just refuses to open for uh, one racial group or another. Great. Because of my idiocy and laziness, do you know what I have just built? I have built a racist door. That's the kind of thing that can happen if you're not careful with this type of software. And again, actually, uh, now that I think about that, that actually is a not a bad metaphor for uh, racism uh, arises out of idiocy and laziness. But uh, anyway, so if I sell a great, if I try to sell one of these to a grocery store, there's going to be problems everywhere. Uh, customers are rightly going to feel uh, pretty wronged and traumatized by that. Um, this is 2023. I hope people aren't still doing that, although it does still happen, unfortunately. But now we've automated racism. Great. We've automated racism. Um, so the store itself might be on the hook for a civil rights lawsuit. Uh, individuals are going to be uh, rightly miffed. The store it might be on the hook for a civil rights lawsuit. Uh, certainly no, no one is ever buying a door for me ever again. That's for sure. And I'm always going to be remembered as that jackass that built a racist door. <laughs> So yeah, um, and actually I'm surprised, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, some troll has already created this on TikTok. But uh, anyway, now why would the training process create such a strange result? I did not, again, remember, I did not try to create a racist door. I'm, there's not some piece of code in there that says, you know, take citation from, you know, Jim Crow South and create a racist door. No, I did not do this is accidental. I did not intend to do this. This is entirely just from laziness and not using a sufficiently representative set of training data. Um, so, but why does this happen? Why, then why, uh, what is going on here? Where does the origin of the strange result? I mean, you think about it, aren't all humans approximately the same shape? 
you know, we got two limbs, two legs, a head. We're all about the same size within, you know, at least in terms of absolute scales, you know, between one and three meters tall. Uh, well, three meters would be a bit high, but, you know, somewhere in that range. We're approximately the same size and shape. Um, why can't it just say, why does, why would race even matter? Can't you just learn to recognize things by, say, like, silhouette? Um, our silhouettes are all reasonably close. Um, why can't the program just learn to recognize the shape of a human silhouette? And then that would work regardless of race. Because that might not be the easiest and most reliable way for the learning algorithm to maximize its own reward function. Maybe in training, it didn't, uh, you know, you might be thinking that you're tra training it to recognize people, but it doesn't know what a person is. Uh, maybe in training, it learned to just focus on, say, a human head. Maybe it, in maybe if I, let's say, let's say I only included images of white people in my training data. Uh, if I did that, it might have learned to define human as not my entire human body, but just my head. And to that computer, a human is a face with a skin tone and facial structure of a white person or in you know, representative of a Caucasian ethnicity uh, to the computer. That is what a human being is. You know, you could show it. You could you could decapitate my head and put it in front of the computer and it would say, yep, that's a human. No, no problem here. Um, just the arrangement of pixels that resemble a white person's head. That to that code is a human being. They are one and the same. And that kind of thing can happen in these black box systems. Again, you're not manually programming it. It is just blindly, you know, randomly guessing and uh, taking random paths and applying evolutionary algorithms until it produces something that, that will uh, maximize its reward function. And sometimes that can produce very weird results. In that kind of case, uh, just this arrangement of pe uh, what it defines as human is an arrangement of pixels that resemble a white person's head. If again, I only included Caucasian people in my training data and any outside this definition, according to this computer, are not human. I started with a biased data set and my resulting algorithm is just as biased as its training data. And this doesn't have to just mean a racial bias. If I train it with only images of men, I may I may have accidentally created a sexist door. If I had to teach it what a, if if I you know again I had to teach it what a human being is, and if I only gave it images of men uh, in its data set in its training data, uh, the resulting algorithm may only recognize men as humans and may only open for men. Uh, that would be an I mean, you, you, again you might think why can't it just work on silhouettes, but Again, these systems, they can produce very unintuitive results with biased training data. Uh, you can, and you can think of other examples. What about age? Uh, this is actually one that can happen very easily. Think about how hard it is to get training data. You need to actually get people. If I'm trying to build this, uh, you know, door, I need to get people to walk in front of my cameras and, you know, uh, get images and videos and things. So getting videos like that of children it's going to be difficult. Like not many people actually want, I mean, not many parents want to just provide me, lend me their children so I can use them to train my machine. It'd be very convenient to just to say, you know what, I'm just going to leave kids out of this data set. Let's just hope it's good enough. Well, if I do that, I could end up with a case where the door will open for adults, but not for children. Now, if you're, if you're operating a, you know, adult entertainment business, maybe that's okay. But, you know, for things like a grocery store or a retail outlet, that kind of thing, you probably want it to open for people of all ages, not just the adults that I could get to, uh, you know, um, to train my uh, algorithm. Uh, and this goes further. Uh, what about, you, you especially might have to worry about people with disabilities. Uh, and even if you had an algorithm that worked entirely on silhouettes, what if someone's in a wheelchair? Will this software just not recognize them as human? Uh, what if someone uh, walks with a walker or a cane? Will this algorithm in this door uh, not open for them? The, oh, great. Now I may have opened up companies that I sell these door to's, doors to uh, to ADA lawsuits, American with Disabilities Act lawsuits, because I have now just created an ableist door that will not open for anyone in a wheelchair. This kind of thing can happen when you're using these uh, machine vision systems. Uh, or, you know, it can go beyond that. Uh, what if they're missing an arm because they were in a table saw accident? If I lose my arm in a table saw accident, will this door still see me as human? Um, so uh, these kind of unintuitive things can happen when you start with, when you uh, work with non-representative data training data sets.
And really, I guess if you want to be poetic about it, I guess it turns out AI systems work a lot like humans. In many ways, uh, some of our worst social ills could be considered as really a, a flaw in our definition of what it means to be human. Uh, racism, in some ways, could be seen as, fail as a failure to see humans of all racial and ethnic groups as truly human. And the same with sexism, bigotry, uh, perhaps even things like runaway greed. And in humans or AI, these result from an improper learning process. People are taught that only some subset of humanity counts as truly human. AIs are taught the same, and it's garbage in, garbage out. For both humans and AIs, uh, if either lack a sufficiently broad uh, or representative definition of humanity in their learning process, they will end up treating some portion of humanity as something less than human. This kind of uh, thing has been highlighted in fiction. Uh, the results of bias training data are uh, highlighted in uh, one uh, in one uh, scene or one uh, bit in the show Better Off Ted, where an office building's uh, water, fountains, water fountains and uh, facial recognition entry doors uh, refuse to open and activate uh, for dark-skinned dark skin employees. And this was used comedically in the show, but this kind of thing does have real-world examples of, of these kind of things going very wrong. Again, it's garbage in, garbage out. If your tr original training data is not sufficiently representative of your uh, final uh, uh, in-service uh, set of humans or whatever you're looking at, then you're going to end up with biases and these things can go very wrong. Now, uh, so far we've talked only about you know hypothetical examples. Does this actually occur in the real world? Are there actual real world examples that we can talk about of either machine learning or uh, you know uh, machine vision systems that go off the rails from uh, likely from the result of incomplete training data? And yes, there have been several. Uh, one particularly infamous example was an AI uh, image recognition system, uh, Google built into their Google Photos platform. Uh, they trained an algorithm to label the contents of images. Uh, so, you know, Google Photos is a platform that you can upload, you know, uh, photos that you take with your smartphone or camera or, you know, just photos you can collect from the internet or from wherever. You can upload and back up them, upload them, back up them. Uh, you can even like order prints, that kind of thing. It's just a photos platform. But they wanted to get, they wanted to build an algorithm that would allow you to easily search the contents of uh, of your photos. So, for example, uh, like most uh, cat owners, I uh, probably half the photos in my phone are cat pictures. But uh, if you have a you know thousands and thousands of photos that you've taken over the years, you might want to search for photos of your cat. So the idea is that you could that you could put in in the search bar the word cat. And the system uh, would then output a bunch of the cat pictures. It would find all the cat pictures in your uh, photos and show them to you, just like a search, like any other search algorithm. Uh, it is a image search algorithm. And uh, you know this example is from a couple years ago, probably think like mid to, mid uh, 2015, 2016, something like that. Um, sim you know, seems simple enough. They trained it not just on cats, obviously, but they tried. To, they trained it on a whole bunch of different search terms. You know, they would, uh, if you want to train an algorithm to do that, you show the algorithm a bunch of pictures of cats and show the algorithm a bunch of pictures of things that aren't cats and then train the algorithm that way. And then afterwards, it can hopefully identify images of cats. Simple enough. No, there's nothing wrong with identifying cats. Nobody could, no one would really object to that. Um, sounds perfectly perfectly reasonable. However, uh, you know, they spent a lot of time and millions of dollars building building the system, uh, testing it, and then finally deployed it to the public. They unleashed it upon the world and yikes. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of this case before, but it didn't take long for a particularly horrifying error to surface. <sighs> I'm hoping I don't get demonetized for even describing this error. Uh, when you searched gorilla, well, it would return images of gorillas, like actual literal gorillas. If you had gone to the zoo and taken a picture of a gorilla, it would show that picture of that gorilla. However, it would also return images of black people. If you, uh, you know, if it would simply, if you search gorilla in Google Photos, it would just label images of African Americans as gorillas. Yeah. I mean, it was that bad. Um, and why that was is hard to say. They never, I don't, know if, I don't know if they ever really released a lot of details, but it seems like it's probably a case of insufficiently diverse training data. They probably, you know, again, Silicon Valley, not necessarily known for being the most diverse place. If they based all their training data on their own employees, 
Maybe they just didn't have enough training data, or diverse enough training data. Um, so yeah, and it turned out that if they didn't have enough uh, suitably diverse training data that represented all of humanity, it would not it would not recognize some subset of humanity as human, literally. And uh, and uh, this wasn't some coded thing that they could just correct. Remember, this is a black box. It's not like someone sat down and told it to be racist. It was just something that spontaneously arose from the training algorithm from the original uh, incomplete data set. Uh, the only uh, way to fix it properly would be to retrain the entire thing. Um, now, why did this happen? Well, I mean, if you think about it, like all human beings aren't actually that different from gorillas. I mean, I'm not that different from a gorilla. You're not that different from a gorilla, assuming you're a human watching this and not an AI. Um, but all human beings are actually not that different from chimpanzees, gorillas. We're all primates. Um, but the difference was they, you know, if they, if they, uh, the, the system knew to separate one subset of humanity from all the other primates and call those group, those, those objects, those images as human, but they didn't have a sufficiently diverse training data set. And so, uh, people that were not represented in that data set were lumped in with, uh, with the gorillas and that's what happened. Um, and again, it's a black box. It's not like there's a line of code that you can point out and say, oh, that's the problem. That's where, let's just, uh, oops, somebody turned the racism tag on. Let's just turn that off and it will, the problem will go away. No, they couldn't do that. It was all just one big black box, uh, you know, fuzzy logic algorithm. And they couldn't just separate that out. Uh, they couldn't get the, they, in fact, they, they tried, but they couldn't get their algorithm to not label uh, black people as gorillas. The only way they could do that would just be to start the entire process over again, start over with a, uh, a properly diverse training data set and just do the whole training process and spend those millions of dollars all over again. Um, and they did eventually do that. But in the meantime, they came up with a, a very uh, lazy solution, but did solve at least the problem of uh, black people being labeled as gorillas. And the way they did that was a very uh, slapdash solution, which was they simply made it so the term gorilla would return no responses at all. So you could go and, uh, you know, go to the zoo, take a hundred pictures of literal gorillas, fill your phone up with gorilla pictures, ask the Google photos, show, find pictures of gorillas, and it would go, can't find any gorillas here, boss. They just made it so, they just hard coded it so that the, the search term gorilla returned nothing. Um, not exactly the ideal solution. Their algorithm behind the scenes was still, a, you know, it's, it's basically the equivalent of, we can't make this thing not being race, not be racist, so we'll just uh, muzzle it to prevent it from saying anything racist. Um, again, gorillas uh, simply returned no results, and it was kept like this for years. I think it's been a uh, fix since then, but yeah, it was a major PR blunder, and obviously a lot of people were pretty hurt by that. Um, I think I'd be, I would be hurt by that too. Um, nobody deserves to have that kind of thing happen to them. Um, and it's not just in Google Images. Uh, similar, similar racial biases uh, in machine vision systems have been seen in facial re recognition technologies. Uh, there, been, you can search, uh, just search, you know, in Google Scholar or in Google, just you know, racial bias, uh, facial recognition technology, and you'll find all sorts of papers and cases on that. Um, a lot of facial recognition technologies uh, and systems simply have a much lower accuracy rate for people with darker skin tones. And whether that's some property of light or whether that's just, or it may be, but most likely just a factor of they didn't have diverse enough training data. They didn't make enough effort. They built, you know, people, off, off, employers often build, you know, companies often build these systems uh, using a sample of convenience, often their own employees. And they end up with a soft piece of software that isn't as accurate in identifying faces for one racial group or another. Uh, in fact, just a couple days ago, there was a case that I thought I'd bring up. Uh, there is currently a woman suing the city of Detroit uh, for arresting her, apparently based on uh, facial recognition software the police were using. Uh, now, two sides to every story, that kind of thing, but I'm just going off of her version at least. Uh, according to her, the officers simply took the word of the facial recognition software on complete faith, uh, not bothering to perform uh, any actual police work. 
And so they had facial recognition software running, looking for a particular suspect. And it said, oh, this is your suspect. And without any thought, they uh, arrested her as a wanted suspect. Um, and they did not, and it's pretty clear that they didn't put in even the slightest bit of the laziest police work possible um, to determine whether this person could or is likely the person they're looking for. Uh, why? Well, because the, the suspect, uh, that the, the, the crime that she was arrested for is carjacking. Uh, their system flagged her as a suspect of who who is wanted for a recent carjacking. Uh, fair enough. I guess, you know, men or women can participate in carjacking. That's really not surprising. Uh, but the kicker is this particular woman, she's eight months pregnant. They arrested a woman for carjacking, a recent carjacking, who is currently eight months pregnant. And despite all her protests saying, look, just look at me, there is no physical way on this earth I am in any physical condition to rob someone of their car at gunpoint, they didn't care. They simply said, look, the machine, the box tells me, the computer tells me you're the suspect, we're arresting you. Look, I'm no criminal expert, but, and, you know, maybe there's some Olympic athlete out there or some incredible martial, art, martial arts uh, master, uh, you know, martial arts master woman that could do, that could do a carjacking while eight months pregnant, but I'm pretty skeptical. And if you're arresting a woman who is eight months pregnant for carjacking, which is more reasonable to conclude that you've just arrested some, that you're just arresting some sort of uh, god tier martial arts master woman, or that you simply have the wrong person? Uh, common sense would show this can't be the right person. This woman is eight months pregnant. It is extremely, extremely unlikely that she is the suspect who just committed a violent carjacking. Common sense would say that, and would say that this couldn't be the right person. But the police, out of either, um, we don't know what exactly would happen here, out of ignorance, laziness, or, you know, misplaced trust in this black box uh, computer algorithm, or some combination of the above, uh, the police simply took its word, and they said, the box tells me that you are the suspect, I am arresting you. Zero thought, zero effort, zero common sense, they arrest someone who is basically physically impossible of committing the crime that they are accusing her of. The computer told them that that was the person, so they arrested her, and that was the beginning of it, and that was the end of it. Pretty ridiculous. And I, if you know, again, two sides to every story. This is still a developing thing. It only ha happened a couple days ago. But you know, if it, if things went bad, went down the way she said they did, um, man, I hope she sues their pants off because um, she certainly deserves it, deserves uh, whatever money she gets out of that. Um, and, and and then another case of racial bias and machine vision comes from the field of dermatology of all things. You know, skin disorders and skin lesions and that kind of thing. Um, you know, people have tried to develop algorithms that will allow you to automatically diagnose uh, skin disorders from an image. Um, you know, if, that, that could actually be a very useful thing. If you've got a weird bump somewhere on your skin, uh, you know, the ideal would be you open up a phone, you take out your phone, open an app, snap a picture, get a diagnosis, get a, get a diagnosis, you know, just instantly, this is nothing to worry about, this is normal, or go to the doctor immediately. That would be great. But yeah, that would be a fantastic tool. If you could actually uh, create something like that, that would work for everyone. That would be a great tool of great benefit to society, great benefit to humanity. You know, just literally take a picture of something. It'll give you a diagnosis of your of a skin condition. Sounds great. That was that's the goal anyway. If it works, it would be a great idea. Um, so people have tried to, so, you know, doctors, dermatologists, uh, have tried to use machine learning, uh, to develop tools like this. Um, so for example, they used, uh, uh, they might use a machine learning algorithm, uh, and train it on, um, so for one case, some cases I've heard of, uh, they developed, they tried to develop such an app. Uh, they used a machine learning algorithm and trained it on images found in, derm in dermatology textbooks. Uh, so, you know, there's different skin disorders, there's all sorts of different skin disorders, and there are, uh, if you want to become a dermatologist, uh, you know, you are, you are a doctor specializing in skin disorders, and there are textbooks you can get, and, that you, and then if you are a student studying this, you will get dermatology textbooks, and 
those textbooks are just filled with images of, you know, here's what this skin disorder looks like. Here's what this skin disorder looks like. Here's what this skin disorder looks like. Lots of images of all sorts of different, different skin issues. The goal, with the goal being to train you as a dermatologist to recognize what these things look like. Recognize, you know, benign things from cancerous things. Recognize uh, different uh, different types of skin disorders. How to, and then also learn how to treat them, that kind of thing. So they used these dermatology textbooks as the source of their training data. Well, you can probably see the problem with this. Um, in these traditional textbooks, almost all of the reference pictures for different skin disorders are of what these skin disorders look like on light colored skin. And this is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you know, just traditional uh, racial bias in the uh, medical field, that's not really that surprising, but also just um, uh, apparently certain skin disorders are just a, a little easier to visualize on light colored skin than dark colored skin. And so if you're trying to train students, it can be useful to um, it can be useful to give them examples that are most easily identified. Um, and if when they're first learning uh, how to identify these different um, skin disorders um, and that's might that might be fine for training for training uh, purposes. But when you're trying to create an app that will diagnose skin disorders, and you want it to work for people of all skin colors. And when you then create this, and they, they, then you then unleash it onto the world, just put it out there and say, here's an app you can trust to, to diagnose your skin disorders. You can see where the problems arise. Um, now, the I have a link below uh, discussing this. Um, and I think the link actually just uh, it re references a paper that shows that this is a potential case. Uh, this could potentially happen. I'm not sure if this has ever actually been released in an app that was uh, proven to have any kind of racial bias in its diagnosis. But the paper that I saw was actually just discussing this as a clear possibility that such app developers really need to carefully consider if they're trying to develop such a thing. Um, but regardless, this is a, a, a case, another case where racial bias can can uh, percolate up through um, visual uh, uh, machine vision systems uh, directly as a result of non-properly representative training data. So in the previous examples we considered, uh, we looked at incidents where uh, machine learning algorithms resulted in uh, racial bias, uh, primarily in machine vision and other systems. But this does go beyond just racial bias. Uh, for example, this problem can occur also in gender bias. Uh, a few years ago, Amazon wanted to build a better recruitment system. Uh, they thought they could uh, lower costs and potentially make a more, more objective hiring system, which, I mean, uh, doesn't that sound great? Who could be opposed to that? Uh, and of course, being a company of tech bros, they decided, hey, uh, do you know what aren't biased? Computers. Uh, let's automate as much of our hiring process as possible and design some uh, really slick AI to do all of our candidate screening and maybe even someday even some of our interviews. Uh, so what did they actually want? Again, they wanted to automate part of their hiring and possibly part of their uh, promotion process. So how, what did they actually, what were they actually looking for? Well, they wanted an algorithm that you could feed in a candidate's information, uh, things like their employment history, education, uh, resumes, that kind of thing. So um, again, you want an algorithm that can screen candidates, but now we're kind of back to the same problem. In order for us to train an algorithm to select the top candidates, we need to teach the program, teach the computer, what the definition of a good candidate is. Uh, we need some set of good candidates that we can show the machine in order for it to know what a good candidate looks like. Again, the machine doesn't know what a human being is. It doesn't know what a company is. It doesn't know what Amazon is. It just has, um, again, it's just a piece of code living on a computer chip. It has no sense of what the world is. So if we want this thing to determine uh, what a good candidate is, we're going to have to teach it what a, what the definition of a good candidate is. They basically went through their their hiring and promotion records and, you know, selected people who uh, they judged uh, to be good candidates at time of hire or during promotions. Or maybe they used their own employer review records. Uh, they used their own internal data to define a, a good employee. And, uh, you know, and they define, ultimately what they were doing is they were defining a good employee as one who gets better reviews and raises and a bad employee as one who gets worse reviews and raises. So a good employee is one who gets hired. A bad employee is one that does not get hired. A good employee is one that gets more promotions and raises. A bad employee is one that does not. Sounds simple enough. What could go wrong? Except, of course, garbage in, garbage out. 
if there isn't if there's any bias in the training data, then there's going to be some bias in your uh, resulting algorithm. And so if there is any gender or sex bias in the hiring and promotion net records uh, used to train this algorithm, the resulting AI will share those same biases. And uh, while it's not while it is difficult to uh, test sex bias in a company, like this is one traditional problem with like uh, gender discrimination lawsuits. Like how, if you know if you got fired from a company and you think you got fired because of gender discrimination, or if you think you got didn't got, did not get hired or promoted because of gender discrimination, how do you actually prove that? Unless your boss literally comes up to you and says, "I'm not hiring because you because of your sex or gender." Well, it can be very difficult to figure that out. If you want to actually prove that, you know, it is illegal to discriminate based on, you know, sector, gender, race, and a bunch of other things, but actually proving that in court can be very difficult. Uh, however, with AIs, though, it actually is relatively easy uh, to, to do that, to test that. You can give it a set of resumes, but the only difference between a set of identifying, a set of identical resumes being certain gender coded things. For example, you could give the algorithm two identical employment histories, two, two identical resumes, and give one, uh, except to give one uh, that has a M in the sex marker and one that has an F in the sex marker. You run a bunch of those through the algorithm that you've trained, and you see whether it favors one sex or another. If it's an unbiased algorithm, it should give the same ranking to identical uh, resumes or employment histories that only differ based on their sex marker. Or uh, alternately, you could be a bit more subtle. You could uh, say, omit the sex marker altogether in on each of the profiles. Uh, don't tell the AI what the sex or gender of the test candidates are. Uh, create two sets of identical resumes, except one has maybe labeled, uh, except label maybe one John and the other Jane on the top of them, and then have the AI uh, run through a number of those pairs and see if there's a bias in the ratings. Again, if you have two identical resumes and the only difference between them is the you know name at the top of them, except one of them is typical for men for men and one is typical for women then uh, if it truly is an unbiased algorithm then it should return the same score for each of the CVs or resumes and so uh, Amazon did actually try to create such an AI screening tool and unfortunately for them it failed those gender bias tests horribly uh, the original training data had some sort of bias in it and that produced a bias in the resulting algorithm and the engineers building this tool uh, ran these tests and found this gender bias in their tool. And, and then, of course, they tried to fix it. Uh, they tried to prevent the AI from even knowing what the sex or gender of any of the profiles uh, in the training data set was or any of the uh, candidates that they would uh, be testing it against. And, for example, they left. They tried leaving out the sex field. They tried leaving out the names. They did everything they could they, they could think of to block the AI from figuring out what the sex or gender of the, uh, the candidate profiles they were testing. But the damned algorithm them just kept finding ways to determine a profile's uh, sex or gender. So there was such a strong sex bias in the hiring and promotion records used to train the data that the algorithm would do almost anything it could to find some roundabout way of determining a profile's sex. For example, if someone if someone's resume indicates that they, they were in a sorority in college, that probably means they're female. If a resume indicates someone played American on an American college football team, well, they're probably male. It just kept finding roundabout ways like that of subtly test uh, subtly teasing out the gender of a candidate. It was like damn near unsolvable. It ultimately all just came out of the original Tate training data used to create the algorithm. And these kind of thing, this kind of thing can go beyond uh, racial and gender bias. Uh, the final example I want to mention um, it has to deal with uh, has to do with automated exam proctoring software. If you're taking an entirely online course and your professor wants to give you an exam, uh, they'll have often they'll have some software that is meant to uh, prevent cheating, prevent academic dishonesty. They'll think software like Proctorio. Now, there has been a lot of evolution in this type of software, so traditional proctoring systems that came around in the, in the 2000s were centered around locking down the browser or computer. They would force you to keep the software open or to keep the tab or uh, browser page open. Of course, these these always had one fatal flaw in that students could just cheat by having a book in their lap or they could uh, just have another computer altogether. Maybe I have this monitor hooked up to a desktop and they have this monitor hooked up to a uh, laptop or something. And, you know, you can just uh, people can get around the software that way. 
So, uh, but of course the exam proctoring software providers, they wanted to attract more clients. They wanted to have something they could, you know, schools and universities like, okay, we are absolutely sure we'll prevent students from cheating. And so they had the brilliant idea of adding eye tracking algorithms to their software packages. And uh, many of y'all are currently in school or have uh, been in school in the last few years. You may be familiar with some of these. They'll not only require you to uh, keep the exam that you're taking online uh, locked, you know, lock down the computer, prevent it from opening other programs or tabs. Um, they'll also try to do eye tracking. So like they'll actually, you know, that th they'll require you to have a camera on that the software will tell you that uh, you must stay looking just right at the computer screen. And the idea is that if you're looking, if you're spending a lot of time, instead of looking at the camera or looking at the monitor that the exam is taking place on. So at least the idea they had was if we can't, if we can't keep people from, you know, uh, using a another computer or a, a textbook while they're taking the exam, we will just directly track their eyeballs so that we can see, uh, to, so we can make sure they're looking at the exam and nothing else. Interesting idea, but like anything, the devil is in the details and the implement, implementation is where things quickly went off the rails. So think about eye tracking. Again, uh, Proctorio and some other providers, they wanted to add eye tracking to their software. Now think about eye tracking. This task is trivial for a human to perform. Uh, following the path of another human being's eyes is fairly easy. Like, uh, you know, if I'm looking at, I'm, I mean, you look at my face right now. Uh, if I'm looking here, 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 it's pretty easy for you to follow the eyes of another human being. Um, you know, it's just something we innately know how to do. So Proctorio wanted to, du to duplicate this human ability and make sure that test takers looked at the screen at all times while they were taking their exams. Well, uh, good in theory, but how did they actually create that software? Well, uh, something like that, again, is too complicated to ever have to have any hope of ever manually programming. It had to be created through a machine learning process. And like all of the things we've talked about, if you want to do that, you need, a set, you need to have a set of training data. Well, where do you get a set of training data? Well, you know, there may be some open source set of eye tracking um, data set uh, of eye tracking uh, example data out there that you could use. Uh, but most of all, most likely they probably had to create it. Um, let's think about this. You get a bunch of people, you sit them down in front of computers, uh, you take images of some of them looking at the screen and you have some of them, you take images of some of them looking away from the screen. So in some of the images, they're looking directly at the screen like this or like this. And in some, they're looking like this, like this, like this, like this. They're looking away from the screen. And you use that data set to train your eye tracking algorithm. Um, fair enough, seems good in theory. But uh, of course, the real world is far more complicated and, and diverse than whatever, and whatever training data they used. It's, it's quite possible that Proctorio or some, some of these other companies, it, when they were developing their training data, they went for the most convenient set of uh, source of training data available, which would be images created from their own employees. So maybe they'd use that to, maybe they use their own employees to create their training data set. Maybe they use just, you know, random people they found on the street and they use something like that to develop a set of training data. And then they use that to, to develop their um, uh, eye tracking software. Uh, seems simple enough. Where could things go wrong? well, you know, where this is going. In the pandemic, a lot of universities uh, really had to very hastily move to software like Proctorio on a large scale without really properly vetting it. So prior to the pandemic, a lot of schools had neglected to properly really develop their online teaching tools and practices. And suddenly because the whole world shut down, they were forced to do a rush job of it and not necessarily properly, you know, vet all of the software and tools they were using in their sudden rollout of mass scale online teaching. There are ways to design courses that optimize for online content delivery that don't require you to do these really invasive, like eye tracking uh, type of exams. There are other ways to do this, um, but they didn't have enough time to do that proper planning and betting. Uh, so they were stuck with their high stakes exam model uh, that was really optimized for in-person in teaching. And so they were really, really desperate for any way to give exams for their online courses uh, in the same way they, they would give high stakes exams for their in-person courses. And then I kind of imagine this like, uh, I'm sure it didn't exactly happen like this, but in my mind, it kind of works like there's this like flim flam man walking into town, you know, practicing, uh, promising these like miracles on the back of digital gods 
gods. I just have this image of like um, Lyle Landley, singing salesman in the famous uh, monorail episode of The Simpsons, who comes to Springfield to uh, sell them a monorail uh, to fix all the town's problems. Imagine Proctorio uh, coming in and uh, p- making their pitch to all their all the uh, universities during pandemic era. Uh, like uh, you have this problem with exams, and you need to deliver these exams, and we have this amazing advanced eye tracking software that'll take care of all of your problems and it'll put your university on the map just like Springfield or something. But uh, anyway, the colleges, and, the colleges and universities were desperate, so they signed up without vetting and testing the systems properly. What could go wrong? Well, as you can imagine, there were some problems and it didn't take long for the inevitable issues you know, to rear their ugly head. Uh, first of all, there were just like in a lot of the other systems we talked about, there was a lot of uh, a lot of racial bias issues in the eye tracking software. It's hard to say where that came from. Probably just from an improperly diverse set of training data. In other words, they didn't make sh- they didn't put a lot of effort into making sure that when they were designing this data set, that they uh, you know made sure to have people of all ethnic and racial groups in their that training data set, or at least insufficient numbers of them. So there were a lot of issues with um, racial disparities in the eye tracking software. Uh, there are also issues with students with various disabilities having problems with the software. Uh, basically, the problem is ultimately that the companies could not possibly have a, tra- a set of training data large enough to encompass all the types of students that might end up using the software. And while they, I'm sure they tested it, they also don't have infinite budgets to test against all different types of people who might need to use the software, so they couldn't test everything properly. They had taught their software that a human being, when they are looking at a screen, looks a certain way. When a human being is looking dead to the camera, you know, directly at the camera, they look a certain way. And people who fell outside of that data set were simply not counted as human beings who are looking at a screen. And so again, garbage in, garbage out. If your eye tracking software is based on an incomplete data set, a data set that does not represent the entire population, then your final tool will not be uh, equally accurate or equally applicable to the entire population. And the Proctorio eye tracking software is found Oh boy, this is this is a really bad one. Was found to make one error that managed to transcend, somehow rise, ascend above even normal racial bias. And this system wanted to ascend not only to not only to to be uh, abhorrent and evil, but wanted to like arise to the level of a cartoonishly evil Disney villain. And I don't know if you've heard of this case before, but that's the only way I can describe it. Just like a cartoonishly evil Disney villain. Uh, students started rep- that. Um, Proctorio's eye tracking software was flagging them for cheating because they were crying. <sighs> yes, they were saying that as the uh, you know the, the system as they're taking their exam, you know it's tracking their eye movements, making sure that they're looking at the screen, and they are looking at the screen, but they're frustrated. They can't solve a problem. They are you know dealing with the pandemic stress. They signed up for an in-person class, etc., and and are taking an online one. They're sitting there in literally in tears, and the stupid computer is telling them they're cheating. Again, this is at the height of the pandemic. Students are quite understandably, you know, going through a pretty traumatic period. Uh, students who had never intended to take online classes and actually paid full price for in-person courses instead of like the discounted courses you often get online, were suddenly foisted in very slap together online courses taught by professors who had never taught an online course before in their life. You know, the, the students hadn't, hadn't intended to teach an online course, the professors hadn't intended to teach an online course, and everyone just caught in this, pl- this web together trying to make the best of it. And, you know, they were, they were often taught with substandard tools and methods, and they were forced to take these high stakes exams using invasive and poorly designed eye tracking software and when some inevitably came to succumb to the pressure and literally broke down into tears in an exam the bastard software flagged them as cheating <sighs> this is why i called this section the uh may man and machine be forgiven for their sins so why did this happen uh, were the engineers of Proctorio like mustache twirling villains gleefully laughing at the tears of students? Well, it is Proctorio, so quite possibly. But uh, more realistically, like all of this, it's garbage in, garbage out. Remember, a machine is not a human being. If you are looking me straight in the eye, I can tell that you're doing it, that you're doing so. 
you know, I can tell if someone is looking me in the eye and all I can do, and, and I can do that in all sorts of lighting conditions. I can do that for all sorts of people, regardless of the shape, their shapes, you know, for all, uh, for all kinds of people of all shapes and sizes, ages and races, gender or disability. Even if you're missing one eye or you, ha you have like mismatched eye colors, or even if you have tears in your eyes, I can still quickly tell if you are looking me in the eye or not. Um, I can do this. Why? Um, I'm not, I don't have some sort of superpower. I'm just a human being. And the reason I can do that is that there are entire portions of the human brain that are dedicated to interpreting human faces. We are social creatures. If I take a single human being and drop them alone in the savanna or the jungle, you know, naked with nothing, you know, on them, they're going to be dead in a few days, if that. You know, we are creatures that have evolved to work as a team, to work as units. We've, in our natural environment, we evolved to work in, you know, to live and work in small bands and groups, and eventually grew into like, you know, eventually grew into civilizations and big societies and nations and everything. But we are social beings. We have to know how to communicate with one another. This is just part of being human. We are social beings. So there are entire portions of the human brain dedicated to interpreting the human face. We even have the ability to, the innate ability to see which, what each other are looking at. You know, we have portions of the brain uh, dedicated to determining the emotional state of someone, uh, sometimes to, to determine, you know, the veracity of someone, if someone's being sarcastic, joking, maybe even lying. Uh, we have portions of the brain dedicated to that. And we have portions of the brain dedicated to determining where another person is looking, whether you're looking directly at the person, whether you're looking to the left, to the right, up and down, etc. Uh, we have that ability. It's like before we developed theory, modern theories of light and optics, there was actually for a time a quite prominent and quite widely accepted theory that our eyes worked not by like taking light into them, that, you know, light rays from the sun, but that we actually had some, almost like our eyes had little laser beams that went out of our eyes. I mean, seriously, like you can look this up. It's pretty crazy. But this is actually a prominent theory for a while. And we still actually reference this, you know, and there's a bit of cultural memory uh, at play when we use expressions like the light of your eyes or, you know, under your gaze. The reason people came up with that was because, you know, human beings have such a good ability to tell where each other are looking. If I want you to look at something, I don't even need to directly tell you, look over there. I can just look over there. If I'm looking over in this direction, you almost almost involuntarily, once you see me looking at something, especially if I don't tell you anything about it, if I'm just like, for some reason, staring over at a certain direction, you are almost involuntarily compelled to do so. I can just stare, you know, I can just stare at a spot in a room that we're both in and without uttering a single word, I can get you to look at that as well. Again, almost involuntarily, you will trace the path from my eyes to see what you're, what I am looking at and your eyes will follow that path. It's almost like a superpower we have. It is really this, a form of nonverbal communication that we have. You can imagine that was probably very useful back in like hunter gatherer days. There's a hunter uh, out on the plains uh, or a savanna somewhere and you want to uh, inform one of your uh, tribe mates, uh, hey, there is a gazelle over there that we're trying to capture or hunt. But if I shout, hey, there's a gazelle over there, that gazelle is gonna hear my voice, get startled and run away. But instead, if I just look over there, then you can follow that path and see what I see. It is this really cool form of nonverbal communication that we have, and very few species have anything like it. We are social creatures built from the ground up to subtly communicate and understand each other on a level really few other uh, creatures can even begin to approach. Um, actually, it's one of those interesting things that uh, dogs, uh, you know, canines, dogs are actually so special because they're one of the few animals that can participate in some of this more subtle nonverbal communication. Um, you know, I actually consider myself more of a cat person, but I will note that unlike cats, which really can't do this, dogs actually can follow your line of sight. Um, and, you know, if, if you point at something, uh, a dog is actually smart enough uh, to be able to look in the direction that you're pointing. If you try that with a cat, well, okay, knowing cats, it's quite possible that they know that you want them to look over there, but they simply refuse to do it out of spite, but uh, dogs will actually do it. Uh, they're called, you know, man's best friend for a reason. But what's, what's really happening is that we've been living and working together, you know, we've been living and working with dogs you know, for such an immense period of time, tens of thousands of years, that really our brains have been able to co-evolve with each other to the point that we're, that they are to a degree intercompatible. Like, isn't that wild that 
um, we are completely different species, not even very closely related, just the fact that we're both mammalian species, but we have been living together and interacting with canines, with dogs, so long that we have evolved the ability for our brains to be a little bit intercompatible. Anyway, I just think that's kind of cool. And ultimately, this is just a tiny drop in the ocean that is human nonverbal communication. Um, for example, the human eye uh, isn't simply a camera. It's actually almost like a monitor as well, a screen. It is a display. So again, when I look left, right, up and down, uh, you know, side to side or directly at the camera here, you can tell where I'm looking. But think about that. There are parts of the brain dedicated to this, but it's also built into the structure of our eye. Um, notice we have very distinctly colored irises, uh, you know, of various colors depending on your family, you know, genetics and such. And then we have this white region around the iris, the sclera. And why do we have that? Why it's like a uniform color? Wouldn't that be easier? You know, just evolutionarily speaking, why not just have a single color across the entire eye except for the actual, you know, people where the light itself enters the eye? You know, wouldn't that be easier? Your eyes are built in such a way that other human beings can see what you're look what you look at. Isn't that wild? Your eyes are literally giving away deliberately, well, in an evolutionary sense, what you're looking at. It is impossible for you to look at something without instructing other human beings what you are looking at. I don't know. I think that's pretty pretty wild. Um, so. Again, you cannot look at something, the, the human eye is meant not only to see, but to be seen. The eye itself is a form of nonverbal communication or a delivery mechanism for that. You can't look at something without giving cues to other humans that something might be worth looking at. Again, you are a social being built to live in a group of other humans and constantly consciously and subconsciously share information back and forth. That is our superpower as a species. Human beings don't have, you know, really powerful teeth. We can't run really fast, although we can talk about like persistence running and stuff and that theory. But, uh, you know, we can't run as fast as a cheetah. We don't have the claws of a bear or the strength of a bear or anything like that. You know, in terms of physical strength and abilities, humans are pretty weak uh, compared to most other animals. But the one superpower we really do have that has allowed us to, you know, take over the entire planet is that we are social creatures. We are able to plan together. We are able to work together. We are able to build together. And that is what has allowed us to do everything that we have done for good or for ill. So, uh, okay, that with that uh, rant about, you know, human history and human nature aside, consider the uh, just the sheer evolutionary immensity that has gone into, into the human ability to track what other people or other human beings are link, looking at. And then along comes Proctorio. They come along full of hubris and they try to reproduce this human ability to track other humans' eye uh, movements. They had the arrogance to think that they, this one company, could do this cheaply and duplicate what is really a masterpiece of nature. They're like a kindergartner trying to duplicate, you know, Da Vinci's Last Supper with finger paint, or, you know, or Michelangelo's David with Play-Doh. They're, you know, fools trying to create in a week what took nature a billion years to master. And then they try to pass off this clumsy imitation uh, off as the equivalent of the real thing. They create this pale imitation of the real, real thing and then just foist it upon the public. Well, ultimately, this is an intractable problem. If there is a bias in your training data, it doesn't matter what elaborate training algorithm and statistical methods you use to you know, train your final um, program or algorithm. Garbage in, garbage out. It is easy to make the mistake and think... Uh, things that we as human beings can do trivially, you know, like knowing where a person is looking, uh, must be simple tasks. It's always going to be very tempting to think. If this is, you know, a trivial task for me, it must be simple for a computer to do as well. But again, when you do this, you ignore that the human mind is the most powerful computational device in the known universe. And we dedicate most of that immense capability to really ordinary everyday tasks that we do just existing as humans in a human world and a human society. Your mind is more powerful than the grandest, you know, supercomputers we've ever built. Um, and you use most of that capability just living your life. This is the core challenge of any machine learning system meant to duplicate human capabilities. 
if you're building a machine learning system to do something that humans can't do easily, for say, for example, like sorting through massive data sets, then you're really less prone to this uh, methodological error. If you want to train a machine to do something that's difficult for humans, then you're less likely to make, I think you're less likely to make the error of thinking that something's probably going to be easy when it's actually hard. But when you build a machine learning algorithm to duplicate something humans find easy, a danger will always exist that you might vastly underestimate the sheer complexity of the task involved. You think a task is simple and you end up creating a machine that is but a poor imitation of human capability. So, um, do I think this technology is just completely irredeemable? Am I just a complete Luddite? Um, do I think that like we should just outlaw this technology, get an international treaty and, you know, banish it from human memory and you know, arrest all its inventors and send them to the salt mines, never to see the light of day again? Well, actually, as an aside, the Luddites weren't, were actually probably right. They were more about like, they were more of a workers' rights movement than anything. Uh, the idea that they are like these primitivists just afraid of new technology is ultimately just steam age corporate propaganda that's wormed its way into our cultural memory. Uh, really, if you want to call me a Luddite, go ahead. I'll wear the term proudly. The Luddites were right. Calling someone a Luddite is a compliment. <laughs> but um, anyway, with that aside, um, you know, we've seen some, some of the ways these systems can go very wrong. But at the same time, this technology has a great deal of, of potential. Recall a previous example I mentioned, the sorting materials in recycling facilities. That is an awesome application of technologies like this because, you know, if you applied that on large scale, especially if the, the technology got better, you can vastly increase the potential scenarios where large scale recycling applications are practical. You can greatly increase the amount of material recycle, which is, you know, never a bad thing. Some other examples. Um, think about an example like such as... Uh, NASA's uh, Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. The Mars Helicopter uh, Ingenuity, it's this little helicopter that was sent on the back of the most recent Mars rover that it literally just flies around. And it'll, you know, it'll be, it'll autonomously fly a certain distance, go up in the air, fly over a certain distance, take pictures, take readings, etc. And that's, that particular helicopter actually has a lot of machine learning uh, baked into it. Um, and the reason it does is because that's the kind of thing that literally cannot be done by a human, at least not a human that is not sitting on Mars. Because think about this, if you know, if you're on Earth and you're piloting a remote control helicopter on Earth, you can do that. You can pilot a drone in real time. Uh, although even now, many quadrocopter drones, you know, have a lot of autonomous capability baked into them. But if you are sitting on Earth trying to pilot a helicopter on Mars, that is impossible not just because we don't have technology good enough, but literally physically impossible. It is physically impossible for you to remotely operate an aircraft on Mars in real time. And I don't care what level of technology you have, unless you have some technology that is completely beyond our known laws of science. And the way I know that is that the speed of light simply doesn't allow it. The speed of light is the speed limit of the universe. And more precisely, it is the speed of causality, it is the speed of time itself. And at its absolute closest, Mars is three light minutes from Earth. And that is the absolute closest, right when Earth is lapping Mars in the orbital pass. Uh, the, close, the closer you are to the sun or any body, uh, the faster the orbits go. So like Mars's year is longer than Earth's, or Earth's year is longer than Venus, and so on. So, um, and so as Earth goes around the sun, you know, every, every so often it laps Mars in its orbit. And right at that instant it laps Mars, there is a three light minute distance. In other words, it takes three minutes for light to travel from uh, Earth to Mars or vice versa. And that is the absolute closest. On average, it's much longer, like 20 or 40 minutes. That is, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, that distance. But even at the absolute closest, you need three minutes to get a signal there, three minutes to get a reply back. That is the very absolute minimum, the, the very absolute minimum, the very laws of the universe allow. And most of the time that's far greater. So no, there is no way you are piloting anything that is flying in real time with that type of delay. Um, if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if someone is living on Mars and you're trying to play like a multiplayer computer game with them, well, Let's just say I hope you like turn-based, uh, you know, slow turn-based games because that's going to be the only option that you have.
of you know Mars helicopters like that have a lot of machine learning uh, and machine vision built into them. And that's like a great application of that. Um, let's think about something else. Uh, let's say I'm studying something in forestry. Uh, I want an algorithm that I can feed high resolution satellite image of a stretch of forest and say count the number of trees in the picture. Or maybe I want it to assess the size or health of those trees in some manner. Like maybe I maybe I give it a, a, a large set of satellite data of you know pictures of different tracts of land, different tracts of forest, and I want it to tell me how many trees there are, what their diameter is, what their height is. Forestry demographic data. I'm sure there's a better term for that. Um, really, that would be an excellent use of machine vision. Why? Well, first of all no one's going to be directly harmed if it makes a mistake. Nobody's going to be flagged for cheating, for crying. Nobody's going to be arrested. But no one is going to be denied employment. No one's going to be physically harmed. No, one's going, no one is going to be uh, traumatized or emotionally scarred. But moreover, there is an acceptable rate of failure. There is an acceptable rate of failure. This is quite literally the, you know, the forest and the trees problem. I'm not studying one tree. If I want to go study one tree, I will physically march out into the woods and study that one tree and gather a bunch of detailed data in person. But I'm not interested in that. In this application, I'm interested in the forest as a whole. And so I'm not studying one tree, I'm studying the entire forest. And if my algorithm that is counting those trees misses one every so often, or maybe classifies something that's not a tree as a tree, that's not necessarily a problem. There are very few people who actually need to know the precise number of trees in a forest. And I would argue that's probably actually an impossible thing to determine because then you have to start worrying about like, when does a seed become a tree? And how big does a sapling get before it counts as a tree? And like, no, we don't actually care about the precise number of trees in the forest. Uh, if you're off by a couple, it doesn't really matter. What matters is how many trees are in a stretch of forest to within a reasonable accuracy. Or if you know, it counts a cabin as a tree, or it counts a, a car that is parked in the forest as a tree, well, that's not ideal. But if I'm surveying this forest with thousands of trees and it counts one car as an extra tree, that's not really a problem, um, depending on what uh, application of study I'm doing. Of course, though, if the error rate is unacceptably high, then that might affect my research. If my machine vision algorithm that's uh, going across the forest image, imagery and counting the number of trees, if it's off by 50%, that's probably going to be a problem. But as long as it's not too high, there has to be some acceptable error rate. I'm probably going to be using this data for, with statistical purposes anyway. So as long as I'm within a certain acceptable error rate, that's going to be fine. Again, if I'm only interested in the health of the forest as a whole, not a single tree, but the entire uh, area, then some error rate is acceptable. Alternately, instead of thinking about uh, examples where the technology uh, uh, could be used positively, uh, let's think of some previous examples that we discussed where the technology went wrong. Uh, how could it be used differently or better? So for example, uh, think about the case of the officers arresting the woman simply because of the output of this biased facial recognition algorithm. How could that have been prevented? Um, well, the first thing that ideally that would have been done, um, it would have been to just have a different algorithm, one that, that was rigorously developed and tested across all racial and gender groups. You know, make sure it well, and also make sure it works well in many conditions, many different light levels, that sort of thing. Develop it with a very large uh, set of training data and test it in similarly, bro in similarly broad conditions. Would that increase the cost? Yes, but I would argue that if you can't afford that level of validation, if you can't afford the cost of that uh, validation uh, for the for the application you're considering, well, I'm sorry, maybe it's simply not financially viable to use that technology for your application. So the first thing that would be ideal would just make sure the damn tool actually works properly and isn't biased to begin with. But secondly, and perhaps more crucially, the officers using the te that technology should have been carefully instructed and trained in the limits in the limitations and fallibility of the technology. Um, it is always tempting when you have a computer program like this, a piece of software like this, uh, um, to see these as like digital gods. It's to see them as oracles. You know, you have people logging on to chat GPT and asking their horoscope or asking it to, to predict the future, sometimes literally treating it like an oracle. It is the combined essence, the combined it, or the combined knowledge of all of humanity baked into one oracle or one divine being or something. No, this is, that's not what these things are. They're just stochastic parrots. They're just 
algorithms that are designed to guess the next word. There is no intelligence there. There is no there there. There is no mind there. There is no ghost in the machine. It's just a black box. But the problem is when you have a black box that is that is doing something that seems kind of human, whether it's creating text or in the case of the facial recognition technology, identifying other human beings, it is our nature to treat them, to ascribe to them capabilities that they do not have. When something starts acting like human, often we involuntarily start treating them like a human. And, you know, if there was a human being that actually had, you know, such good facial uh, memorization and recall ability that they could, you know, identify thousands of individuals, maybe at some point you'd just start trusting that person. You would maybe just trust, start trusting their uh, memory uh, for pretty well without question. That is always tempting when you have a black box like this. When you have a black box, there's always going to exist this temptation to project our science fiction fantasies onto them. You know, we want to think they're data from Star Trek or the minds of the culture or just some sort of like infallible digital god. It's easy to forget that these machines are our creations. As such, they're just as fallible and broken as we are. You know, the uh, what the officers in this case should have done is they should have treated the results of their facial recognition algorithm or their facial recognition tool just like they would any random uh, tip they have gotten you know, from some random passerby. So what would that look like? Well, let's say you are a police officer uh, without such a tool. Um, just in this scenario, you and every cop in the city are on the lookout for a suspect that just committed some horrible crime. In fact, their face is all over the news. We don't need to talk about what crime it is, but it's big enough that everybody in the city is on the lookout for them. And, you know, you're sitting in your squad car waiting, on the ra waiting for the radio to tell you where to go. And as you're parked by the side of the road and, you know, walking down the sidewalk, someone comes up to you and says, hey, the person you're looking for, I think I just saw them two blocks over. If you're that officer, would you take that report as absolute proof the right suspect has been spotted? Probably not. You know, maybe you drive over there and check it out. You know, but but even if you find, you know, the person that, that, that this, this other guy was telling them about or was telling you about, that really is only the start of your police work. You don't just, you know, this person said, uh, that, that came up to you said, I think I saw the guy over there. That's not exactly a, a full-throated endorsement of this is the person. You know, it's not like their brother who's known them their entire life walked up and said, I can say what they beyond a shadow of a doubt that this person is over there. Go get him while you still can. He is right there. He's still there. I'm sure of it. No, that's not what happened. Some random guy just said, I think I saw him over there. You're probably going to go check it out. You're probably going to look into it, but you're not going to treat it as gospel. And so maybe we'll go over there, take a look. And, but even if you find the person that the other guy just told you about, that really is only the start of your police work. Uh, you know, you then examine the person more carefully to see if they match the person, the suspect's description. You ask them about for ID, you know, and go through the, all, uh, go through the regular uh, police process. Although I know I'm probably giving um, law enforcement more credit than they deserve in some cases, as we've seen in, you know, some very infamous cases in recent years. I'm describing more how police should be than how they necessarily always are. Think about that kind of example. You know, someone comes up to a police officer and says, the suspect you're looking for, I think they're over there. You know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Probably look worth looking into, but it's not worth, you know, arresting someone off of just the word of some random person who, you know, saw this other guy out of the corner of their eye, that kind of thing. And ultimately, that is how data from a facial recognition system should be used. That's all the credence it should be given. You know, and it should only be given even that level of credibility if it is proven not to have any racial or gender biases baked into it. But that's not how it was used. Out of ignorance, laziness, or a combination of the two, the police officers involved gave the facial recognition tool far more credibility than, than it deserved and just blindly took its recommendations on faith. In fact, they put more credence in its recommendations than they did the what the evidence of their own eyes. They saw this eight, this woman, eight months pregnant, who could not have possibly been the suspect, and they arrested her anyway simply because the computer told them that that was the person. In reality, they should have given that, that system no more credibility than just some random person walking down the street. Again, a human being is built to recognize the faces of other human beings. We have been doing this since before we have been human. It is baked into the very structure of our minds. This is part of what it means to be human. And even then, 
Think about how unreliable witness testimony often is. We're pretty good at recognizing faces, better than almost any, any machine tool we can build. Even we have problems with it quite often. But again, in this case, they just simply said, the machine tells us this is the person. They treated the thing like some sort of digital god. And what happened, happened. Uh, so is there any way we can create like some general rules or, or heuristics for how machine vision and machine learning systems like these should be used or employed? Again, I'm no expert in machine learning. Uh, I'm just some poor civil engineer trying to make sense of all this uh, in this crazy world that we're in now. So um, I'm just approaching this from the perspective of someone with a general engineering and technical background. What I want is I want rules that I can keep in the back of my mind that I can use to judge uh, future proposed applications of this technology when I come across it. And I can think of three good rules that I could uh, that I can use to judge these systems. Um, you know, let me know what you think of these rules. But I think these are three good uh, heuristics that might be uh, useful when judging applications of machine learning and machine vision. Uh, first of all, these systems are best used for applications where a certain failure rate is acceptable, and where failure will not result in in harm to a human being. If one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand pieces of lumber on a line are misgraded, well, it's not great, but that is something we can plan for. You know, especially if it makes the resulting lumber cheaper, it might be worth it. Um, as an engineer, I can plan for that. Uh, even if this error rate is a bit higher than what a human error rate is, I as a structural engineer can still compensate for that by using a slightly higher factor of safety. Um, you know, the standard deviation on my probabilistic estimate for the strength of a piece of lumber will increase slightly, you know, so we change our calculations a bit and take them into account, and really no one is harmed. We just bake the uh, slightly increased uncertainty into our estimates. And even then, human graders will have a certain amount of error as well. Your goal might not be to eliminate all errors entirely, but just to make sure your, you know, lumber grading system has an error rate that is lower than that of the average human grader. So again, first rule, these systems are best used for applications where a certain failure rate is acceptable and where failure will not result in harm to a human being. Um, second, I think I'll borrow uh, one from the military. Now, the Air Force has a rule for its drone, uh, for its, uh, drone systems, and that rule you may have heard before is to always keep a human in the loop. And what does this mean? Well, if they're sending a drone into a war zone, they make sure that a human being always gives the final order to fire a weapon. Um, now, these things don't, aren't necessarily always completely autonomous. They might let the drone uh, fly itself into a combat zone, maybe even take itself off, if, you know, from the ground if it's if, it, if it's good enough. Uh, they might use a machine vision system to uh, identify a target and track it. You know, they might tell it, hey, there's this vehicle that we're interested in following. Follow it as it moves across the landscape, that kind of thing. They might leave that to the automated system. But they have a firm rule of uh, always keeping a human in the loop. In other words, ultimately, a human being has to be the one to pull the proverbial trigger. They have this idea that only a human being should take the life of another human being. So why do they do this? Well, not only does this provide a final safety check, but provides accountability. And really, that's perhaps the best uh, reason for having that. Um, it's quite possible that, you know, humans are not infallible. You know, you might actually be able to have a system that has a lower rate of error than a human does. The real value, perhaps, of keeping a human in the loop is that you provide accountability. The worst possible outcome is that a, that a machine fires a weapon, a horrible mistake is made, and that no one is held accountable because everyone just shrugs and blames it on the computer. The idea of having a human in the loop, part of it is just to make sure that only a human makes that decision, and part of it is just to make sure that there is uh, someone you can hold accountable. Now, as an aside, I do not have any personal experience to know if the Air Force really does hold itself to the standard in all cases. Now, for all I know, it's just propaganda, but Regardless of whether the Air Force actually holds itself up to its slogans, I think it's a good heuristic uh, for our use of machine learning. If a machine learning algorithm ever puts the health, safety, or welfare of a human being at risk, that system should be incapable of independent action uh, without approval of a human being. Keep a human being in the loop. A machine of any kind should not be making a decision by itself that can directly harm the health, safety, or welfare of a human being. Uh, third, if you are building a machine vision or other machine learning systems, you need to publish your methods. 
Specifically, you need to publish your tra training and verification data. Uh, if you are developing a system that, in that is interacting with human beings, you need to include with your final product information on just what subset of human beings you have verified your product on. People need to be able to know uh, when your tool or system has any validity or when it doesn't. Again, on all of these systems, garbage in, garbage out. If you only train them on some subset of humanity, they will, that system is only going to work for that subset of humanity that you trained your system on. So if you're going to use this kind of system, you need to publish that. You need to tell people, this is the kind of people I tested this on, only use it with those type of people. Mm -hmm. So these systems ultimately cannot be applied to all human beings in all circumstances. There is no way you're going to test your system or train it on literally every human being in existence. There's always, but just by sheer practicality, there's always going to be some limit on who you can train and test it on. But do not tell your customers or the public that this, whatever you're developing, can be used in all circumstances. These systems always work in a limited range of circumstances, and you need to publish what that range is. For example, does your eye tracking software only work for people with two functional eyes that aren't crying in brightly lit rooms? Well, you need to tell potential customers that. Is your facial recognition system incredibly racially biased and you insist on selling it anyway? Well, fine, I guess if you really want to sell a racist facial recognition system, I guess, but put a giant sticker on the side of it that says, this tool should only be used to identify light-skinned criminal suspects. If you simply insist on selling your racist facial recognition system, I mean, hopefully nobody buys it, but at least they can have the warning in advance. Um, these systems will always have limitations, and you, as the engineer designing them, have an ethical and moral responsibility to educate the public and your customers on exactly what those limitations are. Obviously, you might not want to do this. Uh, you know, you might have trouble selling a, a facial recognition system that has a big sticker on the box that says, this algorithm is not useful for identifying dark-skinned suspects. But, you know, if you just can't figure out a way to eliminate the racial bias from your algorithm, and you're not willing to publish such a warning with your software, then you should simply delete that thing and forget it ever existed. Never release it. You are the one creating this tool. You have the responsibility for your creation. You are the one who has the ethical and moral obligation to ensure that it, that it is used responsibly and only within the range of its applicability. So I think these will be my recommendations for these systems going forward. First, these systems are best used where human health, safety, and welfare are not at risk. Second, if a machine learning system is used in such a case, a human absolutely needs to be kept in the loop. Third, the human in that loop needs to be fully aware of the limitations of the system in question, which means you, as the creator of that system, need to publish detailed information on the data set used to train and test whatever a newfangled AI tool you have developed. If you are unable or unwilling to do these things, it is irresponsible and unethical to unleash these machines upon the public. All right. So back to the table saw that started all of this. What does what we've discussed mean for this table saw and its machine uh, vision based hand detection system? Well, first of all, as a reminder, I have no direct experience with this saw. I have no knowledge of how diverse a data set was used to train it. I don't know how rigorously it was tested. But what I do know is that its website does not seem to have any information on how uh, the machine vision system used to, for the hand tracking uh, baked into the saw. Their website doesn't seem to have any information on how this system was trained and tested. It is quite possible that they did a very thorough job, but they just have not published that data, or at least I cannot find it. Now, it is a German company, so perhaps this is buried somewhere in the, the German version of their site, but I, for life of me, cannot find it anywhere. Uh, if any of you who speak German uh, want to check the site out and tell me if you see it there, uh, please let me know, but somehow I doubt it. So really, what I would like to do with something like this, I would love to put machine uh, vision-based system like this one through its paces. You know, systems like this, trained on machine learning algorithms, 
again, are only as good as the data fed into them. You would build a system like this by gathering lots of videos of hands near table saws. Maybe you rank them as safe, moderate, and dangerous, and then train the algorithm uh, to sort new video into one of these three categories. And again, the problem that is that these systems are black boxes. You don't know exactly what criteria they were using to decide whether the video they were looking at uh, shows something safe, dangerous, etc. We cannot see into the mind of the uh, software, and we can't see what it's really using to determine that. Uh, again, now you might think, why would this happen? Again, isn't an arm an arm? Well, again, to me and likely you, a human being with a functional occipital lobe, yes, an arm is an arm. You can show me the image of any arm next to a saw blade, and I can tell you uh, how dangerous that situation is. You know, uh, it, you can show me a picture of a human hand or arm near a saw blade, and I can say, oh, that's that's perfectly safe, it's nice and far away, oh, it's too close, that's dangerous, etc. I can do that because I am a human being, um, and I can do that regardless of uh, height, age, race, etc. of the person who has that arm. For my purposes, as a human being, making that judgment, an arm is an arm. But again, I am a human being, an organism that evolved over millions of years to interact in the physical world with beings like myself. These machine learning systems are just dumb correlation engines uh, responding to input data. They have no idea what they're actually looking at. And as such, they can sometimes train themselves in really weird ways. You know, for example, um, you don't know what these systems are actually using to track what they define as a hand. For example, maybe by chance, most of the people you trained uh, your saw uh, vision tracking system on happen to be wearing wedding or class rings. Uh, you might think the algorithm you trained is tracking hands, but instead it found that tracking rings was easier. So it really it, it, it's actually really giving results based on that. Or maybe you primarily tested it on men. And well, I mean, it's just a simple fact of uh, gender that men tend to, on average, have more body hair than women. That's just a you know fact of human development. And so if you did that, maybe the computer algorithm is doing something really weird where you think it's tracking the arm, but really it's defining the outline of the arm by a region in the silhouette that is represented by body hair. Is it, do I know it's doing that? N not really. But there have been many cases where AI vision tracking systems end up doing weird things like that. Um, it might be not be able to recognize an arm without a lot of hair on it as an arm. Now, that would be a silly error for a human to make. But remember, these systems are not human. You cannot judge them based on human judgment patterns. Um, if some human said, if a human told you an, uh, an arm is defined by the presence of body hair, well, you would think they are insane, but you're applying a heuristic to judge the wisdom and intelligence of a human. The system is not human. What we consider common sense is completely outside of their realm of understanding. Or consider something just like height. People of different heights, builds, etc. will have different arm angles as they place their hands on different locations of the saw. Uh, if your training data was limited to people only of certain height and build, then it may fail when dealing with users outside of that range. And this is ultimately the uh, quite literally fatal flaw of any image recognition system. Any trained algorithm is only good, as good as its training data. I keep coming back to this because it's so important. If there's one thing I want you to remember about this video, it's that any machine learning or machine vision system is only as good as its training data. Garbage in, garbage out. And, let, and unless you have taken great pains to make sure your training set is just as diverse as the entire human population, it's possible that will only be safe for people of certain demographics to use. And remember, this isn't uh, some image algorithm that will at worst create some bad PR for Google. Um, if Google's image search labels black, black people as gorillas, Google gets some really bad PR and a lot of black people get quite understandably angry. I certainly would be if a search tool called me a gorilla. But ultimately, in that case, at least no one was harmed beyond emotional pain. But this, if you are not careful with a system like this that human beings are relying on for their very safety, this could really hurt somebody. This could maim someone. This could kill someone. Uh, people will trust this system. I'm sure if you ask the makers of the saw, they would tell you, oh, this is just a backup. Don't rely on it. 
But that is not how human beings work. People will rely on it and they will become less careful. I described in detail the soft stop system as a comparison because at least with the soft stop system, triggering it has a high cost, um, both practically and financially. Even if you you're, uh, if you think your hand is safe, you know that if, if that thing triggers, um, you are out a hundred bucks or more for a new blade and a replacement cartridge, plus all the time it takes to do that, all the lost time and work, etc. Now, the, the manufacturer of this saw proudly builds the fact that this is a non-destructive safety system. It doesn't require a single-use cartridge. It doesn't destroy the saw's blade. They proudly boast that you just push a little button and in a few seconds it resets and you're right back to cutting without any um, loss in productivity at all. Obviously, this has some benefits. But in this case, when you consider human psychology, what is billed as a feature could actually be a bug and a quite dangerous one. I'm sure the safety system, you know, has all sorts of disclaimers on it saying that it's not to be relied on and that you should regularly practice all of the normal table saw safety practices that you would on a table saw without any safety system on it. And I'm sure they have voluminous legalese saying that you are responsible. I'm sure if you open up the manual, there's all sorts of warnings written by big teams of very highly paid lawyers that say, do not rely on this. This is just, this is just a, this is just for entertainment purposes or something like that. Um, I'm sure they have all sorts of things saying you as the user are responsible. And they would firmly insist that you should be as careful with the saw as you would be one without such a safety system. And that's fine. That's, you know, very much a cover your ass type approach that I would expect any company to take. But this is not how human beings work. Uh, SawStop has similar warnings, but that ultimately isn't what keeps people from being a bit more reckless with SawStop. Because even though touching the SawStop uh, blade will not maim or kill you, it still does have real consequences. If you touch the table saw blade with your hand or finger, you're going to get a small nick or cut on your finger. It's not going to cut it off, but you're going to feel some small amount of pain. And you're also going to have to shell out for a new blade, a new cartridge, and your whole workday uh, might be ruined as, as a result. You know, you're going to be driving to the store to get a replacement cartridge, and you're going to be mentally kicking yourself for being so stupid as to trigger it. And you're going to feel some small amount of pain as that minor cut on your finger heals. And most importantly, if that happens, you are going to remember it. You are going to remember setting that thing off. You're going to remember the embarrassment of saying, oh my God, I can't believe I did something stupid. You're going to remember that small bit of pain as that little nick in your finger heals. Uh, setting off a system like saw stops doesn't have catastrophic consequences, but it does have consequences. And I would say that actually might be a good thing in this case. You know, they're not fatal or life altering, but they are meaningful and real. You know, if you're working at a company that has a soft stop saw, uh, you're going to have to fill out an injury report when that thing triggers, if it's triggered by your hand actually touching it rather than like the miter gauge uh, triggering it. Uh, you're going to have to go through all the paperwork that you would uh, for any other injury, and you're going to have to remember that lesson. But this, a system like this, what are the consequences of setting it off? If your hand gets too close, it drops the blade below the surface. Uh, the motor drives the blade down, your finger never even touches the blade, and he, all you have to do is press a little reset button and you're back to work in a few seconds. Triggering the system is not even worth mentioning. It's, it is barely an inconvenience. And this kind of ease inevitably breeds complacency. If people believe the system will protect them and there are no real consequences of setting it off, they are going to become complacent. It is inevitable. Uh, you can have all the legalese and safety warnings you want, but human nature is human nature. It would not surprise me at all if such a system results in a large increase in dangerous operator behavior. You know, you can put in the manual that no operator should rely on the safety system, but if relying on that safety system allows them to be 5% more productive by feeding material through the saw a bit faster and with less care, it is going to happen which means that they are going to potentially rely on the safety system a lot more than people would rely on saw stop system. Again, if somebody can be more productive by relying on the safety system and there's no real consequence to setting it off, it's probably going to happen, which means this thing better be damn well bulletproof. If it is not, then this could be a very big problem. And to be clear, you know, I have no idea what training data was used to create the system, but that actually is the problem. 
I, as a random member of the public, don't have access to that information. I'm sure the manufacturer has it, but they're not telling anyone. These machine learning systems are black boxes that can often react in highly unpredictable ways. They need to be trained with data representing users from across the population, or else they're on the very real risk of failing when being used by people who are outside that training uh, data group. And this is doubly true for a safety critical feature like this. So what I want to know is, has this machine been trained and tested on a wide variety of individuals? For example, has it been tested on people across a wide range of uh, racial and ethnic groups? Has it been tested for male and female users? Has it been tested for people uh, who are wearing uh, or not wearing otherwise safe forms of jewelry? You know, I mean, fine if it's not work, if it's not trained on, you know, really dangly bracelets and stuff, but, you know, someone should be able to use the saw, uh, whether they are or are not wearing a wedding, a class ring, etc. Has it been tested on people of all builds? You know, from a tiny four foot ten woman to a six foot ten guy built like a linebacker. It has been tested for people of all different sizes. It has it been tested for people who are missing visit fingers? You know, you're using a table saw. Some people who are using table saws have had table saw accidents in the past. Maybe they had one that didn't have a safety saw safety system. Maybe they had one that had a poorly programmed um, machine vision system that uh, didn't work at all. Even worse than, than I'm speculating this one might. Has this system been trained on people missing fingers, either through accident or just from birth? Uh, what about a wide range of people? This is an industrial table saw. I hope there aren't literal children ever using it, but you know, it would be reasonable that you should probably test this on people from the ages of 18 to 90. You can have, you know, an 18 year old up to like a, a, a very senior citizen who is, you know, whose hands are covered in, in wrinkles. And is, are, is the presence or lack of wrinkles on the skin going to affect how the table saws vision system tracks a hand? Maybe. I don't know. These things often react in very unpredictable ways, especially if the, they are being used in a way outside of what they were trained. And also, have, and finally, have they been tested on people wearing clothing of different types that would otherwise be safe for a table saw operation? Now, obviously, I don't expect a table saw to work uh, safely with, you know, people with really dangly sleeves and such. But, you know, whether you're wearing short sleeves, you know, very tight long sleeves, it should be safe for any range of clothing that is safe for normal table saw operation. It should be trained and re to recognize hands in any type of clothing that would otherwise be normally safe. I know that's a lot, and I know that's expensive to train a saw on, but again, if you are designing a system like this and you are releasing onto the world, you need to put in the effort to make sure it will work for all the possible people that will uh, be using this. Or if nothing else, if you can't do that, if you can't train it and, ver and validate it for all, all the different subsets of humanity, then at the very least, you need to publish your training data. People need to be able to know whether they exist within the subset of humanity that you trained your saw on. If, you can't, if, if they do not have access to that, that is a problem. Again, when you are designing a safety system like this, people are going to rely on it. And machine learning systems are highly prone to error uh, from incomplete training data. They are not human. They do not have human common sense. And that training data, again, needs to represent the entire population. And this isn't about wokeism or representation. This is about simple safety. As an engineer, Speaking as an engineer, I don't care if a company does or does not include, you know, women, people of color, or queer people in their ad campaigns. You know, I might have some, I have some personal opinions about that, but speaking from a, from a professional capacity, you know, that's just, from an engineering perspective, that's all just fluff and image. But when you are designing a critical safety system that human beings are inevitably going to rely on, you need to put the work in to make sure it works for, for users of all shapes, sizes, and colors. It, now, is it possible this system was trained and tested across a suitably large data set? Sure, but there's nothing I can find on their website documenting what training data they used. As such, I would be extremely hesitant of this product. Machine vision systems are, again, like any machine learning system, are only as good as their training data. That is the primary message of this entire, long, however long this video ends up. Any machine learning system is only as good as its training data. Since the training data used to train the saw is not public information, I would consider a system like this extremely dangerous until proven otherwise. Again, remember, at the end of the day, an engineer's highest duty is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. This is the first and highest command of the engineering profession. Everything else is secondary. So again, 
An engineer's first duty is to the health, safety, and welfare of the public. If you're releasing a system like this, you need to make sure that it is trained across a broad spectrum of the population so that any reasonable user uh, will be safe when using it. Again, uh, I don't expect it to work for a five-year-old. A uh, five-year-old simply should not be allowed anywhere near a table saw. But uh, for any adult, they should be able to use the saw without a machine vision system failing them. If you cannot train and test your uh, machine vision system across the entire population, then at the very least, you need to publish the training data that you use uh, when creating the system. And I would argue you should do that even if you did thoroughly test it so people can be confident that they are covered by it. Again, what I see here, it kind of has me worried. Now, I don't expect this particular saw to result in a, a huge surge in injuries. The over you know, 50K price tag will ensure that it's only used in very well-equipped industrial settings. They probably did a good job when, do, when, when producing it. It's more the technology it's, uh, itself that I'm concerned with. Um, even if this particular saw in question ends up kind of dangerous, well, it's a $50,000 saw. There's not gonna be that many of them out there. But given time, this technology will not stay confined to German industrial table saws starting at $50,000. It doesn't need a lot of elaborate uh, equipment, a lot of elaborate parts. It's a couple cameras and some computer chips. That's the only hardware that's needed. The software can be copied endlessly. So given time, this technology will find its way into less and less expensive saws, eventually finding its way down into contractor uh, and even uh, the hobbyist market. Cameras are not expensive. Computer chips are not expensive. Eventually, this technology will find its way onto a table saw you can buy, you know, down at your Lowe's or Home Depot or other big box store. You know, and an employer at a big industrial facility uh, can require their employees to undergo formal training before using a saw like this. They can say, look, we don't know how safe the, the vision system is. They can actually, you know, put all their employees in, who are going to use this in a room and say, do not trust this system. This thing is dangerous until proven otherwise. It is a last resort. Do not rely on it. You can make them sit down and, you know, you can put them all in a room and make them watch <laughs> this video that I just put together and make them uh, watch as I drone on about the dangers of uh, machine learning systems. Uh, you could do that. An employer in an industrial setting could do that. Uh, you might run afoul of uh, uh, human rights laws forcing someone to watch one of my videos for its entirety. But um, anyway, but eventually this technology uh, will uh, find its way into the hands of regular contractors and carpenters and just regular hobbyists and users. In other words, it will find its way to people whose only education on the system will be some fine print buried in the back of a 50 page safety declarations manual. And you know how often people really read those things all the way through. And I'm sure the manufacturers will say, well, it's not our problem. You know, we put in the fine print that this is not to be relied on and it's d dangerous until proven otherwise. But you know, there's a difference between legal requirements and ethical and moral requirements and the requirements of the engineering profession. And um, it's not going to stop at table saws. The thing about the saw step system, it's kind of unique. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to adapt to a lot of other tools just because of its unique nature. But a vision system, the, the hardware is fairly generic and, and doesn't really require that much space. So I think you could probably adapt it to a lot of other tools. I could see it adapted to uh, jointers, planers, miter saws, and a hundred other tools. Again, cameras are not expensive. We mass produce these things enough that we can put them in smartphones and things. They're, they're not that expensive. So there's no reason this couldn't find its way into all sorts of tools. So really at this stage, it's important to get this right while it's confined to $50,000 table saws. The, the time to get this right is now, not by the time it's, it's gotten down into $100 tools that anybody can just go to the store and buy. Again, as a final disclaimer, uh, I am not for sure saying that this table saw is dangerous. Don't take my word for it. I have not personally designed, inspected, or tested the saw. I probably haven't been within 100 miles of one of these things. Here, I've been analyzing it just as part of a larger discussion on machine learning and AI system reliability and safety. No manufacturer is paying me to make this video. Again, SawStop isn't paying me to make this. Uh, Altendorf isn't paying me to, Altendorf certainly isn't paying me to make this. I simply saw the video by 731 Woodworks and I really felt compelled to start this essay. Now, it's entirely possible that they actually have properly and thoroughly trained and tested the machine vision system that their safety system is built upon, but that the fact that they don't publish their training data or testing methods has me very concerned. 
if they have done a proper job, I would encourage Altendorf to openly publish their methods so that people can use their product with safety and confidence. And I think that really is best practice. You know, uh, back to my three rules, this is a system that could potentially put human life at risk. I guess you're keeping human in the loop kind of by having it a human directly involved, but a human isn't sitting there deciding whether to drop the table saw blade or not. And it may not be possible to include a human in this loop. There are some systems where that's just not practical, and this is probably one of them. But in cases where that can't happen, you really need to publish your training data. On your website, I should be able to go on and say and see, these are how many, uh, the sample size of people you've tested on, We've tested on all these different ethnic groups. We've tested on men, women, people of different ages. We've tested on people with or without fingers. We've tested on all these different cases. Make people who are going to buy and use their product confident in its safety. Again, I know it's fine to say this is only a backup. Don't rely on it. But you have built a system that human beings are going to rely on. There is very little consequence to triggering that safety system. And I do not care how many warning stickers and how, how big of how many warnings you put in your safety manual, people are going to become reliant on a system that has a, as low a consequence of using it as this one does. So but considering how reliant people are going to be on the safety system, it damn well better be bulletproof. And I hope it is. And if it is, I would encourage Altendorf to publish all their training data um, so that the public can use this with confidence. So uh, I know this was a lot. I know this is kind of uh, a little bit different than my usual thing. This is just what I wanted to share about this. Um, machine vision and machine learning have been very well covered in the news recently in the last couple of years, and maybe in the, even in the last decade, we've seen a lot of this. Um, machine learning and machine vision have been well covered in fields as such as the design of driverless cars, and all the issues and setbacks they have had have been very uh, public. I think probably, yeah, probably eight years ago, people like Elon Musk were promising that we would have, you know, full self-driving cars five years ago. Um, and they were really promising us the sky, the sun and the moon on the backs of machine learning and machine vision. Um, we've been promised all of these things, but it's turned out that in most cases, the technology really doesn't live up to the hype. And again, if it's just a chat bot like ChatGPT, oh well, that's fine. I mean, aside from the copyright issues and issues of stolen work and things like that, nobody's really being directly harmed by this. But this is a critical safety system. Human life and limb is at risk here. And so it just had me really potentially concerned. So while there has been a lot of coverage on ChatGPT and self-driving cars, there's understandably, you know, far less press coverage of some niche German industrial table saw and its safety systems. When I saw this, I felt a need to talk about it to bring this to light. Um, you know, if for no other reason to con to contribute to a broader uh, public conversation on AI ethics and safety. Um, you know, this machine vision and machine learning technology is worming its way into countless products and services we interact with. And we as the public need to be need to demand better and hold companies accountable that don't hold themselves to a high standard of uh, practice. If companies aren't willing to hold themselves accountable, we need to hold them accountable. And if we're not careful, if we are not careful, we will find our, our world filled with these half-baked AI systems, you know, mirages sold to us on the, on the promise of techno magic. But as in the case of The Wizard of Oz, it is paramount that we always consider the man behind the curtain. It is always important that we consider the man behind the curtain. Uh, we may be promised, you know, salvation on the backs of digital gods, but these systems are never as good as they are promised. Um, these are things built by human beings. They're only as good as their training data, and it's impossible uh, in most cases to use a truly complete set of training data. So be skeptical of th these things, ask questions, demand accountability, and you know keep in mind those three rules that I suggested. Um, first, primarily use this stuff in cases where human uh, health and safety are not at risk. Second, where at all possible, keep a human in the loop. And third, if you're gonna use one of these systems, 
publish your training data, or if not the full data set, at least um, deep summaries on the types of people and settings that you have that you have used uh, to train your your system, as well as what kind of testing methodology you used. I think those are the best practices, and really the bare minimum that we should be asking manufacturers uh, when they're implementing this technology in new products that we're going to interact with them. Anyway, um, for those of you who have somehow uh, made your way through the, enti the entirety of this video, I thank you. Uh, I know uh, for those of you who are uh, who have followed my channel for a while, this really isn't my usual content, although it has been a while since I've published anything. Uh, traditionally, I've used this channel to publish lectures and educational videos on civil and structural engineering topics, you know, long form lectures, the type that you would see in a university classroom. But I've been wanting to experiment with some longer form video essays. You know, I've been thinking of issues of AI training and safety a lot, a lot recently, and this served as a useful springboard for some of these topics. Um, you know, go ahead and please, in the comments, please let me know what you think of this. This is something a little different from my usual fare. It's kind of experimental. Uh, if there's interest in more of these long form video essays like this, uh, I might create more of these in the future. Uh, if you think there is a potential essay topic involving or adjacent to civil engineering, uh, structural engineering or wood science, please suggest in the comments. You know, I, this still is, you know, a civil engineering and structural engineering channel. Uh, so I want to stick with things that relate to, you know, some areas of my own. I know machine learning isn't my area of professional expertise, but this particular application is uh, uh, within my wheelhouse. You know, I use table saws quite a lot, do a lot of woodworking, that kind of thing. So it served as a useful springboard. If you can think of any topics that are adjacent to civil, uh, structural, uh, civil or structural engineering or general engineering or wood science, suggest it in the comments and I'll take a look. Um, you know, I could also put it together a long video on my personal research work as well, if there's interest. If you're, uh, if any of y'all would be interested in my work on uh, moisture durability of veneer-based mass timber composites, uh, please let me know. And I suppose I could put something like that together as well. Uh, okay, so um, further, just final wrap-up material. If you enjoyed it, uh, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, if you really like hearing me drone on endlessly about uh, topics like obscure uh, German industrial table saws, uh, there is a Patreon link in the description as well. Uh, also in the description, you can find all my sources. Uh, you'll find links to some of my inspirations for this video, the works of um, Dr. Angel Collier and Dr. Robert Miles. Uh, both of them have some uh, great videos that I suggest you check out. Uh, and you'll also find links to all the real world examples I discussed of machine learning systems and machine vis vision systems uh, going off the rails. Uh, regardless, thanks for watching to the end, and I hope you did find this video uh, educational or at least mildly thought provoking. Uh, making it certainly gave me a lot to think about, and I hope it inspires something in you as well. Um, again, make sure uh, you're skeptical of this type of system. Uh, keep in mind some of those uh, rules and maybe develop some of your own uh, that you can use in your life to judge uh, whether you take the word of someone, you know, the next person who wants to trot out a uh, newfangled AI machine learning system. Um, but I hope you found that uh, useful uh, or a bit enlightening or at least maybe a little bit interesting. Regardless, I hope to see you all, go all again in the next one. And as always, thank you.